Three minutes after 10 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Where I, I, th- I wasn't going to do this. I was going to weigh in on the uh, freedom of movement, the return of freedom of movement, although obviously it's not freedom of movement and neither is it liberty of motion, but it, it is an extension to European Union citizens, a potential extension to European Union citizens of um, uh, for the under 30s, if you like, that the uh, young Europeans could come and live and work in Britain as part of a wider reset of relations. But, I, I, I mean, maybe we'll talk about that a little later. I'm not sure. It's Thursday, of course, and Mystery Hour's on the way at 12. But I, I, it's a weird one doing this job when you're a parent. I've had a child in both cohorts this year, the A-level cohort and the GCSE cohort. And this morning we've, we've had the, the second round of results, and um, this is their story, not mine, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at... Um, describing myself as an extremely proud father on 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 both mornings, but it, it, I remember Nick saying something many many years ago, long before. I don't know if I was even a. I must have been a dad. But Nick Ferrari's kids are older than mine. His sons are quite a bit older than mine, and I, I remember him approaching the f- subject of phone-ins on the morning of exam results with the knowledge that there will be people listening who haven't done very well or haven't done as well as they hoped. And of course, there will be the parents listening, and and that that really stayed with me. And it, it, as a result of that, in many ways, I've stayed away from the subject entirely. I haven't sort of thrown open the phone lines to uh, A level results day or GCSE results day. I've, I've I've sort of tiptoed around the subject for that reason. I don't think it's helpful to weigh in with the oh, don't worry about it. I did fine. Uh, you know, we're incredibly privileged people like Jeremy Clarkson and the fourth Baron Bethel tweet about how you know they didn't do very well in their their public exams and it hasn't done them any harm the fourth baron bethel i kid you not claimed that it was what taught him how to hustle right, the reason i keep saying the fourth baron bethel is because if you're the fourth baron bethel if you are the the, the fourth iteration of a hereditary barony then your understanding of what hustling involves in the summer that you left harrow your understanding of what hustling involves is probably a little bit different to the average Brit. I, uh, mine would be closer to his, given the sort of school that I went to, but even my understanding of what hustling would involve, given that my father was not a baron, and nor am I, uh, nor will I ever be, um, it, it, again, there's probably a slight difference. We may get onto elements of this conversation in the next hour, because the rather splendid James Graham, playwright, scriptwriter, and all-round genius, has made a, given a speech about class in the television industry in particular, which looks at what working class means in, in the context of advancement. And, and that's kind of the point I'm making. When Jeremy Clarkson says, I got, those, I got rubbish A-levels and look how rich I am, he doesn't mention that he was the son of wealthy people. He went to public school. He had all of the advantages that can be bestowed upon a young man in, in, in modern Britain, just as I did. So our achievements must be mitigated by our advantages and our privileges. But some people are very uncomfortable being reminded of that. People without those advantages and without those, those privileges, of course, have very different experiences, which we'll look at in the next hour. But the... The bit from yesterday that struck me, it was, a, it was an odd moment, actually. I don't know if you were listening. If you weren't, we touched on uh, Kirsty Allsop and her revelation on social media. You know, Kirsty Allsop, the property, the TV presenter, uh, and her b- b- sort of revelation, if that's the right word, on social media, that her 15-year-old son had been travelling around Europe with a 16-year-old friend and no adults. And some people, I think mostly idiots, and I use that word affectionately, I think mostly idiots got their knickers in a right old twist about this, uh, having never met the kid and having no personal experience of his maturity or otherwise, they felt they knew more about the suitability of letting him to- tootle around continental Europe with a pal than his own mother did. I, 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 I liked the story for two reasons. I liked it because it was thought-provoking. Why would anybody get cross with another mother's judgment of her own child who they've never met? It was a weird one, right? And it wasn't just the sort of social media age that we live in where you've got to have a pungent opinion about everything. And when we started unpicking that, you you couldn't help seeing the the green-eyed monster, as Iago famously called it in Othello. Um, the the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. Because you were either envious of... Kirsty 
Alsop's courage in letting her child do something that you wouldn't let your child do, but you're too embarrassed to admit that you're paranoid, or you were jealous of Kirsty Allstop having a 15-year-old who would be capable of travelling around Europe on his own or with one mate because you know that your wonderful 15-year-old child struggles to go to the fish and chip shop unaccompanied as a consequence of what? And that's what I've been pondering since we finished that conversation yesterday. As a consequence of what? Because it began with the news that more than a quarter of teachers say that pupils withdrew from their GCSE, GCSE exams this year because of anxiety. 65% said that year 11 students had failed to attend school at some point owing to exam anxiety. Three quarters of teachers sought alternative exam arrangements for their pupils to ease stress levels. Another story today in The Telegraph, again, perhaps a bit unhelpful in the way that the one in three pupils are set to fail GCSE English and Maths. The problem is it's not an opinion, it's just counting. A te- an analysis in The Telegraph today shows that G- this year's GCSE cohort were almost twice as likely to be persistently absent in the run-up to their exams than pupils taking them in the year before the pandemic. Unfortunately, the Daily Telegraph elects to use the word truancy in their headlines. Now, there may be some uh, young people who are not attending school during this incredibly important and formative period who quite easily could be, but would just rather not. My children are are the rare occasions these days when I manage to amuse them. They, They are deeply amused by the prospect of trying to play truant from a boarding school. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a quite a difficult proposition when your school is also your home for the for the duration of the academic term. But I managed. I did manage to, to skive a few lessons it, 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 in, in the, the, the relevant years, despite the fact that my bed room was on the same campus as my classroom. And, and I don't know. That's the problem, isn't it, with this sort of statistic? Well, one, one poll finds the number of children that have been absent due to anxiety and another finds the number of children who have been absent and attributes it immediately to truancy. 11 minutes after 10 is the time. So what I'd like to know is why this particular cohort is so anxious. And we can do it in two ways. We can do it from the personal Or we can do it from the meta, from the overview. I I think that perhaps the children who've just taken their GCSEs are the most sinned against generation in living memory. And and sinned against isn't fair. The most most unlucky generation in living memory. These would be the young people whose first year at secondary school was blighted by lockdown, wouldn't it? So imagine starting at secondary school without a big bunch of mates from primary school. So you would be going through all of the processes of socialising. You'd be learning the lessons. I mean, what's the difference between your final year at primary school and your first year at secondary school? It's absolutely huge, right? It's a point at which sometimes children really change. They become embarrassed by their intelligence sometimes or or, or they become detached from their social groups. You go to a different school from your mates from home. All sorts of things can happen in that first year at secondary school. And for this lot, it didn't happen. You know, they weren't there a lot. And when they were there, they were living in circumstances that were that were really difficult and really different from anything that has gone before. There, there was there were privations of every kind during lockdown, during the the, the coronavirus crisis. But I think that's a good word. Thank you, Callum. Embattled, the most embattled um, generation, the most embattled classroom cohort that I think we've ever had. And, of course, it's not helped by the temptation of older people to insist that younger people these days have got everything so much easier than we had it. But I think that that is why this particular cohort is struggling so much with anxiety. And I want to know whether you agree. 0345 6060973. I also I also want to really grasp the nettle on this one. And I can't, unfortunately. I mean, I don't, since they started at secondary school. I don't really 
use my children as trampolines into topics for us to discuss together because they're, they're, their stories are not my stories to tell. But I, I mean, I can tell you that I don't have the correct personal experience to comment on how much adult anxiety is feeding into teenage anxiety. This was why the Kirsty Allsop story worked so well alongside the GCSE anxiety story yesterday because the parents were going, God, there's no earthly way my 15-year-old could do that, are also the parents going, oh, my God, I can't believe Kirsty Allsop lets her child do that. And quite often, when you've got a pungent opinion that involves being negative about somebody else, it speaks to, there's a bit of projection involved, or it speaks to a deeper, unacknowledged bitterness or unhappiness inside the person with the unpleasant, pungent opinion. And on this case, it would be, my child is, is, is not emotionally ready to to do something like that because of, for want of a better word, there may be different words, better words, for want of anxiety. Anxiety. And what you have there is a very real possibility that it is mum and or dad who have somehow imbued their child with anxiety. So why would 16-year-olds today be more anxious than any 16-year-olds in the last 40 years, let's say, or more, actually. It doesn't work, does it? 60 years. I, I, I suppose wartime aside, although for the huge majority of children going up during the Second World War, unless they were in big cities, their lives would be... Um, uh, well, we, we, we have a concept, don't we, of everybody being affected by the Blitz. In many ways, being evacuated was, was probably emotionally more traumatic for many young people than, than being in the Blitz itself. But war aside, obviously, why would this generation, why did these 16-year-olds suffer so much from anxiety? And how much of it is down to paranoid parents? I, and who can answer that last question? Because we can all speculate upon other people's families, can't we? We can all say, oh, yeah, I know someone, and she's a right old helicopter parent. She doesn't let her children do anything on their own. But you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. What you really need is someone listening to this now to say, do you know what? I think it's my fault that my child is not... Well, I think it's my fault either that my child is very anxious or um, I think it's my child, I think the reason why my child couldn't possibly undertake a, a, a big exercise in independence is because I have passed on my anxiety to them. To them. What do you reckon? So there's the why of it and the what of it. Well, why are this generation so plagued by anxiety? 0345 6060973. -60 and how much of it is actually mum and dad's fault? You wouldn't blame the parents. It used to be a very popular refrain whenever you were talking about youthful issues or youthful problems. Um, in fact, it struck me the other day that when black children were doing worse in school, blame the parents was the constant refrain. Uh, but now that that's not the case, it's generally white working class children. And we'll talk in the next hour about what that phrase actually means, who are performing worse in school. And suddenly it's a result of systemic bias or unfairness or I haven't heard this phrase yet, but we probably will do soon. Two tier education or, of course, it's, it's because there's so many children in the classroom who are bilingual. Um, funny how that particular world turns, but let's not get distracted. What's going on? 0345 6060 Three is the number you need. 19 minutes after 10 is the time. Um, good luck. Uh, it was probably too late for good luck. I should have said good luck yesterday. If, you, if your GCSE results have come out today or if your children's GCSE results have, have come out today, I hope you've got what you wanted. I hope you've got what you needed. And I'm sorry if you haven't. It's a tough old day to get through, week, month. Uh, but it will pass. Everything passes. This too will pass. I think that's from the Bible. Um, but it, but it, it's no comfort to you today feeling like your world has fallen in. I promise you it hasn't. But I also acknowledge that it feels like it has, and that is just not fair. I'm really sorry that you're going through that. But why do we think that your generation in particular has 
suffers from anxiety in a way that, that, that previous and hopefully future generations do not or indeed will not. Let's start in Barnet. Arwad's in Barnet. Arwad, what would you like to say? Hiya. This very, very strongly resonates with me. So if I emotional i i i, I do okay apologize, Take your time. But don't apologize for being emotional I, I took my dcse's three years three and four years ago in 2020 and 2021 okay the two years where Schools. we got teacher yeah. assessed results i ended up failing half of them at the time i had severe severe anxiety i had essentially had to be taken away um to hospital because my mental well-being had gotten so so bad oh, and i just got the help after the incident had, after the incident had happened i'd finally got the help i'd needed for so long okay and i was able my wonderful wonderful teachers were able to do so much for me they were able to help me so strongly even though I, at the time, I went to a little performance school, yes. and I managed to get a place at a Russell Group University. I, I, it, and I ended up performing at the top of my class in coursework and other modules. What, what do you think? And, and everybody's different. No, no two people who've been through anything like what you've been through are are the same. But, but what, generationally speaking, what pressures do you think? you were exposed to that you if you were a different age if you were five years older you wouldn't have been exposed to i mean necessarily you just don't have that massive disruption to your education two years of full time education were essentially so terrible right. phone line i so I'm, I'm not gonna be able to talk to you for as long as i want to and forgive me if i sound a bit if I, if I sound terse as a consequence of that, but but everybody went through the same experience. What were the pressures that that, that you found intolerable? I mean, two years were yeah. swept away. Yeah, just swept away clean. And for some people, a lot of people did really well, but a lot of people who particularly deserved their grades, deserved deserved the grades, didn't do as well. So you essentially had a case where people who let's say, would have performed under certain conditions really well, but under A-level conditions, not as well. And people who would have performed under X conditions well and other conditions not well would have essentially found themselves in completely in, the situ uh, in places where they essentially wouldn't have performed at their best in. Yes, I, I think you're right, and and I apologise not keeping you on for a little bit longer, but the but the phone line's quite glitchy, and and I, and if I if I were keeping our word on a little longer, I'd ask, how let down do you feel by society or by your elders, if you're in this cohort? And let's take it back to his group, the people that sat their exams in in the years where schooling was disrupted. Sounds euphemistic, doesn't it? How, how let down? Have, I mean, how helpful can it really be if you haven't done your GCSEs or you haven't sat all your GCSEs this year due to anxiety to open up the Daily Telegraph website and see it all attributed to truancy? Jacob's in Durham. Jacob, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, I'm feeling quite nervous. <laughs> it's only me. Um, uh, so I was... Um, I did very well in uh, secondary school up to GCSEs, but around there, when exam pressures began to be applied, yes, I um, even in the first year, I was feeling sick with anxiety on a daily basis from the moment I woke up. The first year of your GCSE courses, yes. Okay, and the the um, can we can we pause and wonder why do we know if we do we have we given much thought to why why would you i mean you and when i want to stress when you say you feel sick with anxiety this is not normal this isn't just the normal i don't want to go to school today i'd rather stay at home and watch telly or i did this is a, 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 almost a de, de, destabilizing yeah. level, level yeah. of anxiety do we know why do we know where it came from i i i think it's a it's quite a complicated combination of factors I remember thinking specifically about a teacher I had who was just very sort of shouty and unpredictable, and I would dread his lessons in particular. Right. But overall, just it was a it was a horrid environment from more or less every perspective. Okay. It was um, 
there were, you know, I, I have had issues with bullying, and okay. but I think that arguably the teachers play as much of a role in it as anybody because there's this very adversarial approach. Were you at private school? No. Okay. I was a. a it was a. Uh, um, I don't know if I want to. No, don't go. No, no, you do. You don't, don't do anything you're uncomfortable with. Because I, I, you you draw an immediate contrast with Arwad, who had a terrible time during his GCSEs, and and then he used that phrase. My teachers held me close. My teachers held me up, and and as a consequence of that, two years later, he smashed his A levels, and got into mm. a, into a very good university. So 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 we can't generalise about teachers because there's two completely contrasting yeah. experiences. But this is your experience, and I mean, it, it was as if a... the expectations of you were were unhelpful unhealthy even yeah it's it's not an issue with teachers i think it's an issue with the culture yeah because you talk to the teachers individually and they're very nice and but but then you sort of put that in the context of wider school environment and there's a lot of pressure and they're quite unforgiving and there's no it doesn't seem like there's an opportunity to discuss why you're having difficulties it seems that you are either perfectly on track or mm. you're not and, so how bad did it get oh god um <laughs> i left year 12 i i got an okay prop of gcse results yes um and i left but i i did underperform i think and okay. i left year 12 uh with sort of thoughts of wanting to end my own life oh my. in easter right um, I've since been diagnosed with ADHD and autism. Yes. And, uh... Was that a relief? Oh, I mean... It, 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 it's tough, because yeah. it... In one sense, yes, because you can now... You know, I, I can now say to people, hey, look, I have this piece of paper <laughs> that says I have the thing. Yes. Can I have the support for it? But on the other hand, it's very tricky to sort of. Uh, it, it's, yeah, I understand what you're saying. What's what's the word like? What, what's the opposite of neurodivergent? What's the correct word uh, to use? Neurotypical. So, so being neurotypical generally speaks to an easier life. Ah, uh, it's. I would say so. Yeah, that, I think that's what you're alluding to. So it, it's it's yeah. good to know. It's good to give it a name to know why. Uh, you find some things more difficult than other people do, but but equally, it would be also be nice to 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 not find things more difficult than some people do. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly okay. that. And <laughs> I, I I love the I love my neurodivergence and how yes. it, what it what it, it you know it's a part of me. But I I think it's in in the context of an exam. It's it's very. Uh, I remember. You know, I walked into my first GCSE mock and a girl fainted onto my desk. Wow. And, um, I, I, uh, and I actually spoke with my head of year, uh, about having so it was thoughts of wanting to end my own life. And oh. she said that a quarter of all students had talked to her about that. I, I, this is the trick. The tricky bit that you've identified, having someone faint on your desk, is going to put you slightly off your stroke, isn't it? When you're <laughs> yeah. about to start writing your exams. No one knows. What you need, oddly, is is I need to have been 18 when I was 18 and 18 when you were 18. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to make meaningful, or to, to provide meaningful answers to the questions about why things seem to be so much harder um, mm. For your generation than they were for mine. How much of it do you think? Is, uh, briefly, because we're going to run out of time. But how, how much of it do you think is is parental? And I, I don't want you to be disloyal or say anything you're uncomfortable saying. But uh, I, I do wonder how many people, looking back, maybe from a slightly older perspective than yours, think that some of their anxiety may have been brought to school from home. I think it. Um, it, it my parents were very supportive. Yes. Uh, you know, that's not to say that they were perfect. No, no parents um, are perfect. There was a, you know, that it, it's even things that you might not notice. Yes. As parents sort of, so, you know, if you picture me, I was coming home from school every day. I finally escaped. Yeah. And the very first question is, how was school? Yeah. 
you know, how is this? And it seemed as though every single time we wanted to talk, because they were aware that I was having problems, but it would always they would all it would always come up as how school, how can we help? Yeah. And, and it was it was the one thing that I just really didn't you wanted want to, to switch talk off. You wanted to shut that and, door for, for for the evening, and they they wanted to yeah. open it because they thought and they I, could only fix the things on the other side of that door by going through it with you every evening. Yeah, and I would get very angry. I would switch off. I would it it, it would it it didn't lead to any helpful discussion because no. they just felt like another sort of authority to appease. Yeah, that's beautifully put. In fact, that's a that's a really powerful call that I can tell from my inbox has moved a lot of people and, and also helped understand some of these issues. And I'm going to mention briefly, if I may, and I hope Jacob doesn't mind, an article written in The Times by Matthew Paris this week that essentially poo-pooed the existence of diagnoses like ADHD and, and autism. It was one of the most... Teen- and I've historically been a great admirer of Matthew Paris. He's been on my podcast, which, as you know, I only invite people onto the... Full Disclosure Podcast, if I relish the idea of spending an hour with them, enjoying an hour of their company. Um, it was one of the most unpleasant pieces of journalism I've ever read in a, in a mainstream newspaper. And if I was shy about saying that, then listening to people like Jacob describe their lives and their experiences um, removes the final scintilla of shyness from, from my mind. It's a, it's a hideous position to adopt. Absolutely hideous. And it's, it's not unpopular. 10.31 is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. 10.34 is the time. Um, should we do an idiot's corner? We haven't done, Maybe that's a bit unkind. David's in Peterborough. He goes, is this LBC presenter a spokesperson for the woke and snowflake generation? David, mate, I'll tell you what this LBC presenter is. He is passionately committed to the idea of stopping people who are young today growing up to be as bitter and unhappy as you are. And it's, it's a steep, steep mountain. But it's not too late for you. Empathy, compassion, understanding, listening, all of those things will make you not only a happier person, but if you have other people in your life, it will make you a better partner, a better parent, and a better son. Um, And and if you want to use words like snowflake and woke, that's fine, but they are just synonyms used by people who don't currently have the capacity for compassion or empathy or concern to describe people who do. And those people, those people who put those words in your vocabulary, they are not your friends. Uh, 10.35 is the time. So not not Idiot's Corner. I, 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 think, I, I like to think that Idiot's Corner is for the more irredeemable cases as opposed to the people for whom a little bit of encouragement could still provide progress. Um, Dan's in Nottingham. Back on this anxiety question. Dan, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, um, so I grew up in an unstable household when I was younger. Mum um, was in abusive relationships and so on. Um, oh, although I had, as I see it, I had a happy enough childhood yeah um things that wouldn't have come out at school or wouldn't would, looking in wouldn't have been an issue because i seemed like a happy um child yeah. and so that was that i think were that you was, masking do you think i mean were you putting a, a brave face on things or, or were you actually happier at school than you were sometimes at home um i think it was more to the fact that i didn't want to let my mum down so I never yeah, okay. kind of complained yeah. or made anything of it she had enough um, on her plate without you adding to it you felt yes, as a child yeah, exactly. which is, which is a reversal of the natural order but a perfectly normal way to behave yeah and she had no no interest in you know my education she never right. asked me about school or homework or anything like that and I in turn had no interest in school because yeah. I think I probably had undiagnosed. well I, I am dyslexic so sure. at that time I was probably severely dyslexic um basically went through school uh, wondering why I couldn't do the work that everybody else was doing. Um, this was the uh, mid-90s, so, was, you know, nothing was ever diagnosed. Was, you kind of just see yourself as being a bit stupid. Uh, and when it came to exams, I, can't, I didn't pass any of my exams. I walked into the uh, exam room and I looked at the papers and they just didn't make any sense to me. I couldn't read them properly. Um, if I could read them, I didn't have enough time to make sense of what I was reading. So this uh, this is as a consequence of your dyslexia, and yet for, for people who aren't dyslexic, it sounds like an anxiety dream. Yes, yeah. I think it was dyslexia, which then, uh, which obviously I, I didn't know about at that time, it wasn't even spoke about in the early, mid-90s, so that probably turned into anxiety, uh, because I just thought I was stupid. Um, 
And so I didn't. I went into the exams thinking I'm stupid, couldn't read the papers, couldn't you know make sense of them, and you know ultimately failed everything. Um, and then uh, after leaving school, it was kind of a cho- <laughs> my choice of employment was either a sandwich factory, local sandwich factory, or joining the army. Um, so I joined the army, uh, which my mum was really supportive of. Um, and I think that taught me some resilience. Uh, it well, also it, taught me... It would do, wouldn't it? You'd hope so. Yes. What, what, yeah, I mean, yeah. how, how much of your experience do you think is generational and how much do you think is very personal? Because if, if we were trying to pin down why anxiety, and, and, and you're older than the current cohort of GCSE students, the, 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 I think you've got a sister, haven't you? You look at her experience and wonder why yeah. her generation is going to be quite different from how yours was. What would you point at? Um, I think I point with my sister, um, a lot of her anxiety, I think comes from her mobile phone. She seems to be, she she seems to spend, you know, like probably most teenagers, the majority of her time. See that, that for you wasn't a thing that it's, it's information overload, isn't it? Even if you're not looking at entirely negative things, you're just not evolved is a good word to use is a, is a word that Emma uses to be on it 24 seven bathed in a constant blue light drowned in audio. It's it, yeah. it, it, we're literally not evolved to be doing that, and no. and everybody is almost everybody is. Yes, yeah. Um, I do find looking at, especially my sister's generation. She's now seventeen. Yes. Um, I think that it seems to be, and and her friends too, seems to lack confidence socially yeah. in real real life social situations because they live so much of their social life online and and because the lockdowns and the and the uh, school closures robbed them of the period where they would have developed some of the skills that are now noticeably absent i think yeah i think there's a lot less real life interaction now everything you know do you think it's going to swing back then do you think it's going to swing yep. back um phew. Mm. Don't think so. No, not. Well, I can't see it because everything we're becoming a society where we have less and less human interaction with people that we don't know. Yeah. Um, where and more and more human be... interaction with with deeply uh, unhealthy influences on social media. Not not just interacting with your own friends, which, which means you're not interacting in real life, as it were, but also, of course, falling down these these hate filled rabbit holes that are causing so much damage to so many people at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think it was uh, my generation is you, you would have to go somewhere at least to speak to somebody to fill out a form or you'd have to go to the shop and you speak to people in shops or you'd have to go to... And, and these you know, are all things that, that t- younger yep, people yep. find quite daunting now. I was always a weird one with the phone down. I don't, I don't know. So, so where, where are you? Sort of mid-90s you were at school. So mobile phones weren't everywhere when you were young, when you were primary school. No, I think school. I was... 16, Landline, seventeen. Yeah, so so. Um, but um, I mean, I was at university by the time mobile phones started popping up all over because I used to be terrified of the landline. I just, just like couldn't do it. It was just so weird, and most people found it the easiest thing in the world. But for the younger generation, the uh, the, the, the the things that they find daunting are, are almost impossible for us to get our heads around. That's why it's interesting that you've got a younger sister who you can make these comparisons with. I think that would help everyone. Rather than thinking that things must be a bit like they were when we were that age, but just not entirely identical. And I've noticed something as well while I was listening to Dan, and it, it, it's something you need to help me with. Is if you know, it's it, it's a sort of obvious answer when we're talking about this to say, oh, it's 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 smartphones, James. And if that's all you've got to say, then it's not that interesting. So my I've been subconsciously trained in the years that I've doing this job I I don't know if I should tell you this but you've probably noticed uh, to be a bit impatient with people that say the things that I'm expecting to hear and that's the opposite of helpful in the context of this conversation because we actually don't talk about it enough sometimes the bleeding obvious is the thing that needs to be talked about more so Dan drawing attention to the the constant drip of social media and you don't have to be looking at 
unhealthy or harmful websites. You don't have to be looking at disgusting stuff. You're just, you could just only be interacting with people that you know. But the level of interaction is so unrelenting. Unrelenting is a great word. Unremitting is another one. It's so unrelenting. It's so unremitting that I don't think my generation can imagine what it would be like to be going through that in your formative years. And, of course, it affects our generations as well. Every generation is affected by this. Um, thank you, Dan. At 10.43 is the time. Let's go to John, who's on the Wirral. John, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Yeah, um, I work at a primary school, a large primary school. Um, I'm a deputy head there. Yeah. I'm just on your point about anxiety, um, you know, affecting yes. attendance, educate. We've seen a big spike post-COVID in the number of children who have anxiety mm. um, presenting at school and reluctant to come in. And it hasn't it um, hasn't retreated as much as we would have expected as things return to normal. No, no. That's and I think it's one of those classic things where it's, are we more aware of it or is there more of it? Um, I think it's a mixture of the, of the two, really. I think we're much yes. more aware yes. of children with anxiety. Um, and we cater for it. We're really lucky where I work. We've got a, a fantastic team of pastoral teachers who are there on the gate every day greeting children who are reluctant to come in or have anxiety, make sure they're settled and ready to learn. So, but the cynical side of me yeah. almost says the more we cater for it, the worse it's going to get in some ways. You know, it's hard, you know, we see some children who are really reluctant to come in and the parents, I think, going back to what you were saying before about mm. sometimes parents can imbue children with yeah. their own anxieties and we support parents too, which is obviously something that we should do. But, you know, I've seen children who are super reluctant to come in with their parents at the gate. Once they're in, they're in the routine of school. Anxiety abates. Yeah. Um, and they're happy and they're learning. And then that brings you to a point where you may have a conversation with a family that say, we don't want our child to come in because they're so anxious, they're terrified to come in. We might say... They present differently within the classroom. They're happy. They're engaging with their friends. They're engaging with the teacher. And then masking is discussed. Right. Um, and I think some children do mask. You know, they go home. They've been fine in school all day, but when they get back home, well, they'll go seemed, off like a bottle. They've of, seemed fine in school. They've seemed fine, yeah. They'll go off like a bottle of pop because home is their safe <laughs> place, which is where they can, you know, they can decompress. Yes, of course. If you like. Um, but I also feel everybody deals with certain levels of anxiety and it's important that we support children I, I, to come I, this, in as much I, as possible. You're knocking at the door that we, we, we explored, I think, earlier this week or late last week as a, a professor made some comments which were a bit similar to yours. They could have been misconstrued, but, but there is a point at which what you would call loving encouragement Yes, has yeah. a role to play as opposed to loving accommodation. Of, yeah. and, and I don't know where... i tell you something that will make you laugh. Older than the children that you look after. Yeah. But a pal of mine who's, um, uh, it, 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 whose child is doing brilliantly now, that second year at university, but had a miserable time d during GCSEs and missed a lot of school and was in a proper state. And mm. about the end of her first term back from university, she said to her dad, I can't believe you let me stay off school like that. And he, he was like, what do you mean I let you stay off school? It's, I just, yeah. You were telling yeah. me the worst things were going to happen if you had to go to school. You, you, you couldn't, you know, you were almost paralyzed, emotionally paralyzed. But looking back, she somehow felt that he could have been a bit more... What was the word I used? A bit more lovingly encouraging as opposed yeah, to lovingly yeah. accommodating. And that is, in a way, the hardest one of all because you get it wrong, everything gets worse. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, we feel for the children who are missing out on those days in school, you know, and we mm. know it's difficult for them to come in. But it's that, you know, I'd love to know more about masking. Because I don't know if, if I don't know if masking is the wrong term. If it's well, my understanding better, of it is better phrase. Yeah, you know? my understanding of it is specific to autism. I'm sure it has wider yes, applications. Yes. But but it's when you you know that you're neurodivergent and you want to present as being neurotypical. So yeah. you you behave yeah. it and the exhaustion involved in that. I don't know whether it's a helpful analogy, but trying to speak with an accent all day that's not yours. Do you know what I mean? Just trying yeah. to, if, like if I'm trying to yeah, talk with a Scouse accent all day long and, and, and every yeah. time I, f I slipped a bit, 
um, uh, I'd, I'd feel, oh no, I'd feel shame or I'd feel embarrassed. Yeah. I think it, I think that's a good way of understanding it, but I don't know what the applications are of that phenomenon outside of that that sphere. They must be real. I, I presume they're real. John, thank you. And and that's it. I mean, the teachers got so much to deal with already, and then this adds a new dimension to traditional responsibilities. The question of whether things will swing back interests you, I can tell. Um, Natasha uh, references friends in the Netherlands uh, where family uh, would often put their phones away, spend time actually socialising. There are phone-free cafes, phone-free parks, gaining popular- popularity in that generation. Sam Smith's pubs in London often try to have a, a phone-free section or uh, there's one up on Marleybone High Street I wondered in the other day and it just said you're not allowed to use your phones in here and I thought crikey and it wasn't uh, in, a, in a cool way like you know I think at Soho House they used to have they probably still do have a ban on using your mobile phones because they didn't want Dom Jolly sitting in the corner going I'm in Soho House they just they, they the pubs are doing it it actually said on this little note in the pub um, they, they were trying to encourage conversation. The reasons why you used to go to a pub. For, I mean, listen, I'm aware of all the dangers of alcohol and the rest of it, but pubs are one of the few places, pubs and parks, I suppose, where you would be likely to talk to people in some depth about to whom you didn't already know. How chilling would that prospect be to the generations that we're discussing this morning? I just want you to go into that room over there and start a conversation with someone you've never met before. Could you just go and sit down on that bench and start talking to the person sitting next to you? I, I, I listen. I, I have nothing but sympathy for for what these young people have been through, but I'm fairly confident that for most of that generation, that would be a a chilling prospect. Many, many, not most, many of that generation, this would be quite a chilling prospect, which is all pertinent to the broader conversation that we're having today. Um, I think uh, many of you are telling me that masking can be com- uh, can be very, very um, uh, commonplace, not just in the context of, of autism, but any neurodivergence. It is 10.49. 10.51 is the time. Um, uh, this is, I, I do enjoy these conversations, uh, which is an odd word to use because we're, we're describing difficulty. But, of course, it, it, you know what they say, a problem shared is a problem halved. And I can tell you but from the state of my switchboard and my inbox that there are families up and down the country that are dealing with these things in secret, in private. In fact, I don't know how many people you can see now where, where you're sitting, where, where you're listening to me. Obviously, if you're in the bath, this is unlikely to work. But if you've got headphones in at work and, and you look around that room, there will be someone in that room dealing with what we are talking about today, uh, dealing with either the repercussions of their own situation or worrying about their children's. Be people who are putting brave faces on up and down the country about their children's GCSE results um, while screaming inside not not necessarily about the results but about the struggle to get to that point and and we don't talk about it enough which is why i I am short of patience uh when it comes to people using words like snowflake and woke as a pejorative as if talking about your feelings is a bad thing or or talking about your conditions is a bad thing it's a consequence because you can always muster up some sympathy for everybody if you try hard enough it's a consequence of of PE teacher culture or stiff upper lip syndrome. Young people taught from a very, very, very early age to ignore or batten down their own feelings. And and so two things happen there. This is relevant to the conversation we were having about Kirsty Allsop. There's a subconscious bitterness and envy because you, you know that you carry pain but you think that it's normal. You've convinced yourself it's normal to carry pain. The best indication of it is probably a very short temper um, I, I was reading a lot of the details of the rioters who were being sent to prison yesterday. And, and again, it's not difficult to muster up some sympathy if you try hard enough. These are people who can't control their emotions. They're unregulated. They're easily manipulated, easily provoked. Someone whispers in their ear that the police are keeping the details of a killing of children from them and their rage at the police can be almost immediately ignited. These are people carrying enormous pain as a consequence in large part of denying and silencing their own feelings or having tough love at home, as you might call it, or being ignored by parents or told by their parents to man up or toughen up or or, or, or pull their socks up, not unique, of course, to men. And what they grow up to be is angry and subconsciously envious. Why are we spending so much time talking about these young people's feelings, bloody snowflakes, woke generation, what about all my rage that I never admit to 
except when I'm saying sorry for exploding again to my own family. That, that's what you're dealing with when, when you've got people sending you messages trying to turn woke and snowflake into pejoratives. And, and, you know, showing them a little bit of love is not necessarily as hard as you might think. 10.54 is the time. Diane's in Hornchurch. Diane, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello, Diane. Um, I've got a lot to say. Um, first, first of all, I think I'll start with, you know, I had quite a dysfunctional childhood. Yes. So when I went to school, there was one particular teacher who had I not ever been a part of her classes and stuff, um, I'm not sure I would be the person I am today. So I want to say that. But hmm. I also want to say that when I work with young people now, my first one of the first things I say to them is, I do the work I do because I now do a lot of youth work. Yeah. Because had I had someone like me back in the day I would have done my life quite differently what a wonderful reason to do what you yeah. do eh? so but I worked in education for 16 years as a learning mentor um and I came out of it because I was so disgruntled with it um yeah. because there's so much pressure put on these kids you know it's how do we describe the pressure in a way that helps older people understand how it's different from what they endured that's a challenge I, I haven't always risen to. Right, okay. So when we were younger, yeah. and I know we've touched on social media, but I'll just yeah. throw that in. Yeah, we never must. had social media. We never had a pre the pressure of looking a certain way. We never had the pressure of being a certain type of person. You know, they've got all, all that. the time. All yeah, the time. We might have time. we might have had it on Saturday evening at the roller disco, or, but we didn't have it 24/7, <laughs> yeah. did we? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I remember as a teenager when punk come along and I absolutely grabbed hold of that with both hands, dyed my hair, that my dad was like, "Oh my god." Um, <laughs> but it was my, it was also it was it was all, almost my way of saying, "Listen to me." Yes. Like what I've got things to say as well because it was that stiff British upper, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that, you know, oh, we don't talk about that and, oh, no, no, we mustn't discuss that, you know. And to a certain extent, a lot of parenting nowadays has kind of still got a touch of that. Yes, but in definitely. Different ways. Yes. Um, and I love working with, like, my field is teenagers, really. The ones that other people close the doors on, the ones that the other people don't want to work with. I want to work with these kids. I want to know the bigger picture. I want to know what's going on for you. Why did you constantly truant from school? Why yeah. did you self-harm? Why, you know, I, because if we don't look at that, we're not going to, we're not going to help these, pe these young people. They're up against, you know, I've seen kids self-harm to an extent where they've had to be hospitalised yeah. because of the pressure of going into exams. That's wrong. It just is, isn't That's it? That's wrong. Pick it, you know, I've got four of my own children that I raised, um, and they've all done really well f for themselves, um, not necessarily financially, but they've all followed their dreams, and yeah. I support that because I want my kids to be happy. I don't care if they're not financially secure. I want them to enjoy their life. It'd be nice if they were, and, and but if they're not oh, going to, if it's not going to keep them awake at night, that's a win. I, do you know, I was thinking about this yesterday. In, in the sense that the things we never really say to children are things like, do you know you're a really easy person to talk to or you're a really good friend yep. or, or you're a really nice... Absolutely. But, I mean, we, these, we, these things think, are not valued, are they, in the environment you're describing? Exactly. And I do, like, I've do. i done parenting groups and I'll say to parents, we're quick to chastise and punish. And yes. But how often do we praise? And it might be the most simplest thing. It might be that... You know, he remembered to put the milk back in the fridge. Did, did you say to him, oh, thanks for doing that? Because the other day you left it out and I had to go and buy milk. Mm. Silly little things. Because as much as people don't like to admit, or kids don't like to admit it, praise feels good. They might rubbish it, oh, you know. But deep down, we all like to <laughs> Calm down. Calm. Mine, mine would say, calm down, Dad. <laughs> yeah, get like that. <laughs> but one, can I just say this as well? Of course you um, can. I've got um, a grandson who's autistic right. and... We, you, I love this scenario, and I use it a lot in my work. It's called the Coke bottle scenario. So if you imagine a bottle of Coke going in, like being in a kid's pocket in school, yeah. and all through the day, it's, it's never open, but it's shook up, it's bunged in their bag, bunged on the side, da -da -da. and then when that child goes home, you take the lid off and the bottle just explodes. That's masking. Yeah. That's what, you know, not necessarily... Autistic children, like you quite rightly said, it can be anybody who suffers with 
you know, worrying and yeah. anxiety and stuff. You know, when you take that lid off, like I've, my, I've seen kids that are so well behaved in school now I'll have a parent come in and say oh when he comes home he you know he does this and he does yeah. that and I go because he's had to you are his safe place when yeah. he comes home that is where he can let it all out and it you know unconditional love means sometimes we hurt the people that we love but it's because they're allowed and then you've got you you know you've got other parents who sadly because of you know, poverty or holding down lots of jobs and things. They haven't got the time to sit with their kids and 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 it's just oh, it, it's so right, much. It's what, what gives you hope? I have to have hope because I've got two grandchildren now who are coming up in the world and yeah. I, I just I love my work. I absolutely people like I'm, you I'm will very, be you'll be giving hope to a lot of people listening. As long yeah. as there's people like you out there doing what you do, things things. Yeah, I've had a lot of young people that I've worked with when they were sort of school age and they've come back to me as an adult and said, like, oh, Diane, you know, we haven't worked with you. I don't know. I don't think we've got through school. I don't think this. And they're the little things that 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 far surpasses any pay packet or... We all like a bit of praise, Diane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do. I, I, I don't know that there is a purer ambition i suppose you could chalk it up as a, as, a, as a sort of evolution of self-interest but there are a few chalk, purer ambitions than wanting to do wanting to be someone who would have had an incredibly beneficial impact upon your younger self if they'd encountered someone like you are now that's beautiful thank you it's 1101 <laughs> It is four minutes after 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It's Thursday as well. I hope that doesn't come as a major shock to anybody, which means that uh, all all things being equal and sort of natural disasters notwithstanding, we will be uh, diving into the delights of Mystery Hour uh, after 12 noon today. But before that, we, we return to a mystery that has animated us during almost all of the time that we've spent together, perhaps more than anything else. And it's relevant in part to some of the conversation that we had in the last hour. It's probably, if you had to break every conversation we had down into its constituent parts, what are those dreadful things called that the pollsters do? Word clouds. You know word clouds? If you had to break every single conversation we have or every topic we discuss down into its constituent parts, I think that class would probably pop up more than anything else. More even perhaps, no, more definitely than race, because you can't really talk about race without talking about class. Of all the things, of all the little jigsaw pieces, so you take any topic that we talk about together as a completed jigsaw. I don't know why I'm running with this analogy it's already tortured enough but i hope it were and then you smash up the completed jigsaw and each little piece has got a name the piece that would pop up most often in all the jigsaws that we assemble together i think would be class Uh, and and quite possibly working class issues um James Graham is currently one of my favourite people on the planet. He is a a genius playwright. He's a really lovely bloke. He's a deep thinker. And he, perhaps most importantly, he creates absolutely banging content, dramas, plays, films, including one that is probably the most memorable play that I've seen in the last few years. Admittedly, it was about the newspaper industry, which is very close to my heart. But I don't know if you've seen Dear England. Um, a, a portrait of the England footballer and team manager Gareth Southgate, which got a West End transfer. It's uh, been turned into a TV drama series. Um, he, I mean, he's done loads. If you don't know how much he's done, look him up and stroke or listen to the full disclosure interview that he gave about a month ago to me, which came out while I was on holiday. So I didn't get the opportunity to big it up quite as much as I would have done had I not been on holiday. The, man's, the man is a legend, a genuine legend. And he is absolutely inarguably working class. He grew, you know, he grew up very near where 30p Lee grew up, actually, uh, and went off in what you might describe as the polar opposite direction, except that his concern for fellow working class people is built on trying to improve their lives as opposed to trying to encourage them to hate other people who are um, underprivileged or vulnerable, but a slightly different colour or or from a slightly different um, ethnicity. I want you to approach this perhaps not entirely from the perspective of the television industry because most of us aren't really qualified 
to talk specifically about the television industry. But what he's done in the McTaggart Lecture, which is the big industry address at the Edinburgh Television Festival every year, I'll, I'll give you an idea of how prestigious it is. Matelist did it a couple of years ago. Uh, you've got to be you've got to be huge to do the McTaggart Lecture, and um, and James Graham gives it this year, and he uses it to draw attention to, among other things, but the bit that intrigues me most, it, to draw attention to the absence of working class representation in his industry, uh, which I, I could pretty easily essay into my industry, and you could almost certainly translate it into your industry. If it is a traditional profession or, or a more highly paid role, then it is not one that is going to be well represented or is going to see high representation of working class people. Now, the traditional definition of working class in this kind of conversation would be determined by the professional status of your parents. And that's really interesting because you might think of yourself as working class even though you're earning half a million quid a year and flying your own helicopter around the home counties. And you would be perfectly entitled to because class is not about where you are. It's about where you come from. It seems odd, really, to think of it that way around because our natural instincts are, 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 to, see it, um, are to see it differently. Our natural instincts are to see success as being class progress or class movement. But James Graham puts this really, really well. Um, he says it's not just about money. You do not stop being working class the second you get a pay rise, nor um, do you become working class the instant you might drop below a certain level. So it's about a lot more, in a way, than status. It's different from status. Your status and your class can be two very different things. There is migration between classes, but nowhere near as much as there used to be. The reason why television programs for listeners of a certain age, like Keeping Up Appearances, featuring the inimitable Hyacinth Bucket, are so powerful, are so popular in this country, is because they speak to truths and realities that we all know. Uh, the social climber. But it's not about status, it's about something else. And I will never stop being fascinated by what it is actually about. He talks about it being hard to measure. It's much easier to define areas of diversity such as racial representation. And the quote he uses is that can fire up the activist in us. So I show you someone who is being discriminated against or held back because of their ethnicity, because of their minority ethnicity. Minority is crucial. And... I can fire you up. I, I, not, not everybody, but generally speaking, it's visible, it's easy to see, it's minority status, and it's unfair. So the unfairness becomes incredibly easy to convey. It's not easy necessarily with class issues. It's, it's harder to pin down. It's harder to measure. It's harder to define that particular area of diversity. And that's why it's so easy for people who do not give a monkeys about the welfare of the working class to pretend that they do while they are fomenting racism or encouraging attacks upon the, the police, many of whom, of course, will be working class men and women. It, it, because it's hard to define, it's easy to ill-define or, or wrongly define in pursuit of your own agenda, whether it is, you know, clicks on social media or attention um, on the political stage. So that's a sad development that we've lived with recently. That's why I mentioned the fact that James Graham grew up in the same sort of mining communities that 30p Lee Anderson grew up in, because um, uh, you, you can see the two directions that you can go in when it comes to representing working class culture. You can even work, pa provide passionate um, expositions of it, or you can pretend that the plight of the working class man and woman in the United Kingdom is somehow a consequence of people from... Uh, other backgrounds, other ethnicities receiving unfair uh, preferen preferential treatment. So how do you do it? How do you do it? Well, I, I, we've talked about this a lot, but what I want to pin down today is the bit that you can't change. 
right? Not not the bits that you can change, like your income, or even your accent, or even your social circle. But the bits that you can't change. I think this might, I don't know that this one's going to work, you know. Because normally at this point, I'd have a couple of ideas bubbling in the back of my head about what you might say to me. I can't think of anything. Parental contacts. So I got my first uh, uh, job in newspapers. I got my first break in newspapers by selling a suit to John Major. Because my father was a newspaper journalist, um, uh, uh, people like to claim that it was a consequence of nepotism or that it was a, a consequence of unfairness. And I used to bridle at that. But of course, when I walked into the newspaper office where I'd got a shift because I sold a suit to John Major while working in menswear, I had huge advantages. There were people in that newspaper office who knew my dad. My dad hadn't got me the shift, but I had huge advantages because of his professional status. So, I mean, it's not nepotism in the sense that I only got the job because I got two shifts on the Daily Express gossip column. It was up to me what I did with them, but I wouldn't have... Uh, possibly done what I did with them if it wasn't for the for the soft privilege that I had by being able to say to the assistant news editor, I think you knew my father. Uh, and then, of course, there were people I'd been to school with in that office, uh, the old school. T- so the things that you can't change, and crucially, I want you to... T- and we're talking about class, not race, to be clear. Obviously, you can't change your race, but the whole point of this conversation is to find the common ground between the two diversities. So it's very easy to define race. It's very hard to define class in the context of the things that you can't change. And what I w- and the way in which I want you to do it is by telling me about the moments you realised that. The moments you realised the things you couldn't change. The, if you like, the characteristics of being working class that you kind of hadn't clocked until you got ambushed by them. The things you can't change. 0345 6060 is the number that you need. It's coming up to quarter past 11. I, I, I mean, the... The subtext, the important subtext of all of this, the, the, the purpose, I beg your pardon, of all of this is atrocious representation of working class people in the television industry in the first instance. The, the figures are actually obscene. The, the percentages of people, it's, it's like single figure representation. The number of people in the television industry uh, considered to be working class stands currently at about 8%. Middle and upper class is the highest it's been in 10 years, standing at about 60%. But you can't really have a meaningful conversation about this if you don't know what the words mean. And I still don't really know what they mean, which is why James Graham, who has one of the finest writers of his generation, it's fair to say, has a bit of a way with words. It's why he's opened a door I hadn't noticed before. And it's about, it's not just about money. It's not just about your parents' jobs. It's, it's not just about the way that you speak or the way that you dress. There's something here. There are things here that are either impossible or incredibly hard to change. And unless you are carrying them into the workplace or the world, you probably don't know what that's like. Let's try and find out, okay? What are the things, what are the immutable characteristics? That's a great phrase. What are the immutable characteristics of a working class background? I'm really worried about this one. But you usually come through for me. 0345 6060973. The immutable characteristics of a working class background. Let's see how we get on with this. It's quarter past 11. Quarter past 11 is the time. The immutable characteristics of the working class. And, you know, just in the interests of of nuance, definitions and words, um, I, I, I don't normally do this, but... There are two fighting age migrants who've just been accused of grooming underage girls, um, sex with a minor, and also human trafficking. Uh, And um, some people often claim that I ignore this sort of thing on the program and then fail to provide any evidence to to support these claims. But on this occasion, I I am, uh, you know, uh, prepared to report two fighting age migrants um, have been accused in the last 24 hours of grooming underage girls 
sex with a minor and trafficking. So I presume that the usual suspects, Yaxley Lennon, Farage and the rest of them will soon be coming out in very, very, very strong condemnation of Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan. Quarter past 11 is the time. What are the immutable characteristics of the British working class? Charlie's in Hackney. Charlie, what do you reckon? Hi, yeah, I just want to say I'm a university lecturer just about to retire. I was born working class and I took advantage of all the uh, free education. Will you die working class? Um, well, this is what I'm about to say. I, <laughs> I, well, this is it. This is. I don't think I'll change from being working class. I think I'll always be working class. Sure. But I, I took advantage of what my parents and grandparents got for working class people to have a free education. Yeah. I became a, a lecturer at a university. And there's something called a double on belonging where you end up at a certain point in your life where you've lost communication with your working class route. Yes. Yet you're not included in the party of the academic middle class. So you get to a certain point in your life where you, it, they call it a double on belonging. And Annie, I know that. A French double on right, belonging. So yeah. So Gosh. you get to that point later in life. It's like being mixed race being, in a way. Well, it's Perhaps. just like you don't belong anywhere, yeah, mm. at that point. I've, I've, I've heard that it. description, not that word, but I've heard that description applied to, to, to um, ethnic and racial experiences as well. So what, yes. are, what, what, are the, what are the immutable characteristics that hold you back from making the transition, as it were, the, tr the full well, transition? I mean, well, apart from anything else, there's, all, there's, uh, there's accent discrimination, which is still evident, and it's evident... You can change your accent. Industry. I know you shouldn't and well, you wouldn't you want can, to, but yeah, you can. But what, it's, yeah, absolutely. So you can become invisible, if so. But by coming invisible, you're sort of becoming that middle class person. But you weren't. You're never included into that. And I don't want to change my accident, accent or my social identity just in order to be able to do a job that I'm now qualified to do. Is what I'm talking about. Uh, and I don't see why I should really. No. Well, that I mean, I, there's going to be a million different answers to this question, isn't there? Yeah. So, so, so you yeah. are conscious of. I call it the glass door, if you like, that you yeah. can't get through. And yeah. then the other door has shut behind you and you can't get back. But you don't yes. particularly want to. You want to live in a world where there aren't any doors. Absolutely. And also, I mean, I had free education as a result of wars and yes. social movement and all sorts of things to be able to have that. Do I say mobility? Maybe I don't. Maybe it's just equality. But... You, you will find later on that you're excluded from both, including bit, your parent culture, uh, because yeah. of, of, of where you've moved to, or maybe your accent changes, like you've just said, you know? Yeah. So, Did you ever think uh, about that? Did you ever think about uh, trying to sound a bit more kind of estuarine? Oh, I did RP? in certain times. I had to in certain, uh, I had to in certain situations change my accent and is it I as mean, bad the, now as it was when you were younger because I, I mean it's been right the way through it's endemic it's has, but it hasn't gone up or down it's just a solid if you talk like well, you my, the, the, the students that i teach tend to be of a different uh, accent right class and so that's kind of it that's a show that free education is now over and only certain students have access to that no, I don't uh, know that. I, that do, I mean, statistically, yeah. there's more people in tertiary education than ever before, Charlie. Yeah, but when I went to school, uh, when I went to college, I didn't pay for education. No. Kids are getting into debt now. So they are. They're getting they into are. student uh, loans. It's a slightly different conversation. I was just talking about that. Yeah, the, the access but, yeah. has increased, not decreased. Yeah. I, I think it's important to, yeah. to chalk that up. F final question. What are the presumptions or the prejudices that you think people carry towards your accent, which is the most obvious signifier of your class? I think that I lived in the United States for a while. It didn't exist. Right. And I know that they've got different class delineations and that in the United States, a large sure. is based on color and lots of other things. But it doesn't exist in other countries. It does still exist in the UK. And what, do they, what does it denote, though, to the people? Well, it, it, does, it denotes whether they take you seriously, whether you get the job, yeah. whether you're accepted onto the course, whether you get funding. I lost funding for a master's. Uh, course because I was told by the governing body to go and check where people on my course did their first degrees and since it was mainly Oxford and Cambridge 
they were the ones who got the funding and I didn't. That yeah. was just one situation. No, and, and so, the, the one yeah. of many. And it, I mean, no one is disputing that it's there or the difficulty sometimes of, of pinning it down in substantive terms rather than subjective terms, rather than the, the, the personal experience that is clearly true but doesn't necessarily feed into a, a, a kind of academic definition of what these immutable characteristics are because, by definition, accent is not immutable. It's a bit of a pet subject of mine, but there is no earthly way that Jacob Rees's pieces speaks the way that he does organically. You know, the, uh, Ian Duncan Donuts, the same. It took a decision at some point to try to sound posh in the same way that many of my generation, my cohort of public school boys, took a decision in about 1986, 1987 to try to sound a bit less posh. Uh, I, I don't know why. It's just the way the cookie crumbled. But, but, but accent is therefore not immutable. And because accent is not immutable... The, the, the real sort of um, the real tragic snobs of the 1950s and 60s started trying to define the words that would denote your class, even if you sounded proper, even if you sounded uh, upper class or well, middle class. They, they, they made a list of words. There was an academic at Birmingham University in conjunction, I think. It's, this is one of their moments when I have no idea where in my memory this is filed. Was it one of the Mitford sisters? And, a, and an academic at Birmingham University made a list of words that would denote that you were from the lower orders, even if you sounded like you weren't. They called it you and non-you. So if you said toilet instead of lavatory, I presume, or, I don't know, bog, you said toilet or settee, lounge. There's all sorts of words that would somehow act as code. And then there's pronunciation as well. There's the weird words that the posh people pronounce in entirely absurd ways, utterly unphonetically, in order to sort of keep out the lower orders or provide a sort of indication to each other. So accent is mutable. What, what, what are the immutable characteristics of a working class background? 0345 973 It's quarter past 11. I think my clock stopped. It's 11.26. My clock stopped at quarter past 11 and I've only just noticed. Let me just have a quick chat with my colleagues. Have I missed a break already? So what time is it now? 11.26. So I'll carry on talking, shall I? Okay. I will go to a call. It's all right. I'm not completely useless. Craig's in Newcastle. Craig, what would you like to say? Um, hi, James. What um, time have you got, Craig? Uh, oh, uh, you're asking me now because I'm not looking at the right screen on my phone. No, nor um, was I, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, 11.26, that'll do. 11.27, what, what was on your do. mind? Um, so, the I originally called up to talk about representation of working classes in the arts. Yes. Um, and uh, and your, your producer um, asked me about this, this immutable question. I wasn't have been listening properly, and I do apologise <laughs> for that. Um, you, you you talk about whatever you want to talk about. Tell me whatever well, you want to tell me. The, the, the two things are sort of connected in of my, my mind. Yes. The, the, immu the a possible immutable, immutable characteristic of being working class. I grew up in a uh, working class town in Northumberland and went to a, um, a state comprehensive in a, a very economically deprived area. Yes. Um, and I think one of the immutable characteristics isn't necessarily something that um, comes from within being working class, but something that comes from without, and that's this notion of some areas of uh, of life are just not your natural habitat. Yeah. Um, and I think that with the... Like being an actor. Um, well, yeah, like, so, so my story is I um, acted all through in school plays and what have you and, and loved that and enjoyed that. But anything outside of that, the idea of being an, an actor, of becoming a professional actor, was sort of, it was never mooted. It was never put forward as, a, hey, if you like to do this, mm. these, are the, these are the ways you can do it. You can go here. You can join amateur theatre groups. You can, drama school was something that I didn't even really know existed. And, um, and I, later in life, in my, in my, when I was 29, I joined an amateur theatre group just to get back into it. Right. And, and through that discovered that, hey, I can actually do this. And I ended up working professionally as an actor um, for about five years until COVID shut all of the theatres oh, down. And, and I had, well, it's all right. Sure. You know, I, I had a, a young child by that point and my priorities had changed and, and what but this is I mean, where's the immutable characteristic, though? Because, the, I mean, opportunity clearly 
and I'd use the word vocabulary to, 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 you know, to just know that that's an option. You go to a school like mine and say you want to be an actor. It's a perfectly you can go to a school like mine and say you want to be prime minister. It's a perfectly well, that, reasonable ambition, but it's not. I don't know where the immutable characteristic comes in here. So, so the the the, um, the example I used is like yeah. I say I, I was. It was never the idea of going into certain professions, particularly the arts. Um, is something that I don't feel in my experience, and certainly in the experience of other state school um, graduates that I know of, was ever anything that was even slightly put forward. But even if you make it, it's still extraordinary, rather than a natural progression into a career that you'd always fancied. Instead, it becomes almost magic wand territory. Yeah, and, well, there is a a, a private school in Newcastle um, that, uh, for their end-of-year show, show, Hmm. they used to hire out the the largest stage, like Northern Stage in Newcastle, which is yeah. one of the largest stages in Europe, to put their end of year show on. To and put the school I'm play certain, on, as it were, the yeah, school show. And whilst I'm certainly not saying, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to do that, I, I have opinions on private <laughs> schools. But, but, um, I'm not saying that. I, what I am saying is the, the difference in from a class perspective and going, you can do this if you want to, just go and do it. Expectation, and, entitlement and, versus and, what you're And describing. working class. And I think that is something that is built in to people from a certain upbringing of that. The immutable characteristic, I would say, is... Um, Whatever the absence of entitlement is. Yeah, well, it, it's just it's just this idea of, of never even knowing that that is something that you that people can do. And we yeah. talk about over underrepresentation of working classes in the arts, and I think that is a massive part of it because people don't. You can't be what you a you can't be what you can't see. Yeah, so obviously the um, there are exceptions that prove the rule, but those are few and far between, and um, and they are extraordinary rather than ordinary. Whereas yeah. increasingly, for people from a private school education to have gone into acting or or. or um, TV in general, or whatever it may be, that is ordinary as opposed to extraordinary, Except, uh, unexceptional as opposed to exceptional. Craig, that's brilliant. Thank you. What is the word then that we use as a corollary for entitlement? So, uh, an immutable working class characteristic is the opposite of whatever entitlement is. And I don't know what word to use, but you, you will. You'll come up with something. Thomas Watts is here now with the headline. Eleven thirty-four is the time. Um, the opposite of entitlement, says Andrew, is imposter syndrome. Any working-class person who achieves promotion will feel it on occasion, and and yet, so that's what I was going to reach for. Actually, I was going to reach for imposter syndrome as being the opposite of entitlement. I talked to Neil Basu a bit about imposter syndrome in this week's full disclosure. Um, and yet, I, I can tell you now, almost everyone suffers from imposter syndrome. <laughs> High-achieving middle-class people, high-achieving upper-class people, everyone. I think Neil told me the statistic is something like 70% of the population will suffer from imposter syndrome. It's like you're waiting for the tap on the shoulder to, to tell you that you're having a laugh. All right, yeah, all right, back to what would it be for me, back to measuring inside legs. You've had your fun. I think almost everybody suffers from that. And in some ways, I've often thought that the only people who don't suffer from a form of imposter syndrome are sociopaths. You're capable of uh, imagining different universes, different paths, different lives for yourself. You will have a form of imposter syndrome. Maybe not forever. Maybe you grow out of it. I think that Alan's got a better word than imposter syndrome. But is this an immutable working class characteristic? Unworthiness. It's not for the likes of us. That's one of the phrases I hate most in the English language. Know your place, and it's not for the likes of us. I thought everyone was raised like me and my sister were raised, to, 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 to believe the opposite of those things. It's only when I started doing this job in some ways that I realised some people really, not only have had know your place drilled into them from a very early age, but it has, of course, transmogrified into, into forelock tugging and capped offing, often at entirely undeserving and unworthy individuals who just sound like they've got a couple of conkers in their mouth. Uh, it, unworthiness. Oh, I hope that's not a word that works as, a, as an opposite of entitlement, but I've got a horrible feeling it is. Back to the phones. Cab's in Cambridge. Cab, what would you like to say? 
Hi, James. We Hello. haven't talked about class before. You, you've read a couple of my tweets out about class. You read them out in a way that sounded like you've been really chastised, and I just want to tell you you weren't being. Okay, so that, thank that's you for not that. Where I was coming from. <laughs> I, I get what people are saying about imposter syndrome, but I want to just put it a different way. Yeah. I came from a sink estate in Gateshead. I did a degree at a lesser university and a PhD at a better university, and then I ended up working at the best university world in, in Cambridge. Yes. And that means you're mixing with the Etonians and, and people from what are considered to be the best schools and the, the, the best backgrounds. And it's not my imposter syndrome. Everyone's got that. It's mm. not that I have doubts. It's that they don't. Yes. It's that they have this attitude of not doubting themselves when they've got an idea. And they don't go through the same internal steps of verifying an idea and proving an idea mm. that you do if you're brought up with, without that constant reassurance that you're always right. Oh, and that is such a right. profound difference in, oh, in how you're treated when you're putting your ideas forward, when you have not an ent- a sense of doubt, but a need to prove it. Oh. And they're putting their ideas forward, and they don't. And, it, and it, it's, it's, it's subconscious in terms of the of reaction to it is subconscious. Of course it is. When they put their ideas forward with absolute con- uh, confidence, then you believe them. But it goes further than that. I mean, oh. I, I was sitting in a, in a talk given what's by... Your field, what, what's your field, Cap? What's your field, if you don't mind me asking? I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a microbiologist, a fermentation microbiologist. We've talked in the past about, about yes, vaccines that's and the right. like. I remember. Thing. Yeah, go on. Um... I, I sat in a talk given by a, an engineering professor years ago, and he'd come up with this really clever solution to a, a problem. And it, it seemed very, very good. Uh, yeah. And he was presenting to an international investor, and it was all very, very nice. And he presented with the verification that he was right, that he'd given the project to his students, yeah. and they'd come up with the same engineering solution. So he's a public school in Oxford to educate a chap, teaching a bunch of other public school and Oxbridge educated mostly chaps and they've got the same answers as him so it's right Yes. and nobody in the room questions it nobody in the room says hang on a minute do you not think maybe getting some ideas from further afield or some different perspectives right. might lead you to a different solution and it's like it's like I'm living in crazy land and no one else sees it at that moment. <laughs> just maybe, just maybe there are other approaches and maybe there are other perspectives that might give you a different engineering solution. But even I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of gobby, but even I don't, don't kind of dare stand up and, and ask that question at that point because I'm in a room full of people who are not going to get it. And that, I think, is the, the key part. It's not hey, that you're, in a room have... full of, you, you're in a room full of people who, through no fault of their own, never question their right to be in that room. Yeah, basically. Whereas an immutable characteristic of a working-class background would be questioning whether you have the right to be in that room. Now, your answer to that question might be, hell yes, I do, but you're still asking it, and that's the immutability. It's not my lack of self-worth or my questioning my body to be there. It's their lack of doing so, which is the key difference. No, but it, their lack of doing so only becomes pertinent if you are doing so. <sighs> How do I put it again? Um, no, don't say, I mean, yeah. I, my degree is in philosophy. Yours is in biochemistry. Maybe. So I, meet me halfway on this. <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe that is the way of putting it. But I would, I would well, it must be, because if, that. Their, if their condition is an absence, yours must be a presence. I, I, I guess in, in strict physics, yes. I guess, yes. Do you know what Sophie says? Yeah, certainly looking know, at it. Do you know what Sophie says? Sophie says, so your caller is describing men, James. And, and <laughs> <laughs> But, do you know, she's kind of right as well because the, 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 the confidence with which men say things is, is part of the same condition that you describe, but in different contexts. When people yes, ring in, know. when women ring into the programme, they often begin by apologising because the quality of their this, contribution isn't going to be very good. And of course, it always is, often much better than is, the contributions yeah. of the men who ring in and think that they're, they should be doing my job. This is clearly far more common am- amongst men. But yes. if you find yourself mixing with public school educated oh, for sure. women, no, for sure. then you find that that does slant it in a different direction too. But she's kind of right, yeah. So what was, what, what's, what was the single word we would use then as, as the opposite of entitled? We haven't got one, have we yet? I don't have a word, no. but it's like they're, they're inoculated against understanding the dunning Kruger effect and we're not. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I recognise that. And, and I am, despite having forms of imposter syndrome over the years, I'm very much on the other side of the room from cab on that one, entirely as a consequence of my education. 
entirely as a consequence of my education. I, 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 I am the bloke who can speak with absolute confidence and certainty to a degree where people will believe me more than they would if my manner my, my manner was different. My, my, the, the consequence of my schooling was different. And that is why you end up with someone like Boris Johnson becoming prime minister. Imagine if your only experience of Boris Johnson was on paper. Imagine if we were a non-vocal society. We communicated entirely through vision. And everything that we knew about Boris Johnson was communicated to us through prose on paper or on a screen. You would probably not let him near scissors. Such would be the evidence of his utter absurdity and inadequacy. Boris Johnson is 100% manner. He is 100% attitude, bluster, swagger, 110%. And, and that is, he's a really, and he can end up prime minister of this country as a consequence of what Cab describes. Standing up in a room talking undiluted gibberish in such a convincing fashion that he can end up prime minister of these islands and, and, and win a general election. It's not self-doubt. It's not just doubt. Um, it's, it, it's, it's subtler than that. It's more nuanced than that. But doubt comes closer, perhaps, than uh, some of the other words that we've been bandying around. Cab, thank you for that. Isabel's in Broadstairs. Isabel, what would you like to say? Hi, I've Hello. listened to you a lot of times, and I really love listening to you. Thank so you. I'm very nervous. Oh, it's only me, but thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm definitely working class. Mm. I um, come from the northwest of England, from a working town. I got a degree and I got myself into teaching. And basically, I had to prove myself time and time and time again. And your last caller had it right. Yes. We, as working class people, we have to prove ourselves more than people who maybe went to private school. To whom? To whoever we're working with, to well, you people think, outside. You think you do. Well, I do. But you do, <laughs> you do. do. You do. You do. do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I, and I've got definitely got imposter syndrome because now my accent has changed a lot. Um, there's still elements of North in there. Yes. Uh, um, and, but when I go up North, I'm terribly posh. Do you, right, yes. <laughs> and people look at me and go, oh, well, you're from down there, aren't you? And I go, no, 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 originally I'm from here. But I know a lot of people, it's like being northern. I, you take it, I've come out of the north, but you'll never take the north out of me. You'll never take the working class out of me because I will always be part of that community. But I wanted to prove myself to people. I wanted to show them I can do just as well as you. And, uh, yeah, and, and the... I'll tell you a little, sorry, I'll tell you a little story. When Please. I first came for my interview for my teaching job in Kent... Um, the chair of governors who interviewed me was a lovely man. Um, however, he'd, he'd fought in World War II from Munston Airport in the RAF and fought oh, yeah. terribly, terribly like this. Yes. Uh, and um, he said to me, we, we want to give you the, the job, but we're very concerned the children here won't understand you. <laughs> so I said, OK, I'll go away and work on it. And when I eventually got down, in the first week or couple, first couple of weeks, a child said to me, Ian, miss, I ain't got one in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. I beg your I'm pardon. Sorry, I don't understand you. <laughs> yeah. And when we used to do SATs, because I taught infants at key stage two, uh, year two, when they used to do SATs, one of the words was bath, or, to me, bath. But you said class when you came on. Uh, as in terms, as in. <laughs> you said you were working class when you came I on. I, I no, am. but you didn't say working class. No, because now I've, I've changed my accent. Yeah, in the course of this call. Me. <laughs> I'm very sorry. No, um, I do. I used to do it all the time. Yeah, I still and you do. do it, a bit. You do it because you feel like you're not as good as other people. Well, there's, there's two reasons for it. On a class basis, there's there, but it's also there's a psychological term for it. It's about putting the person you're talking to at their ease. Actually, it's it's like mirroring. Absolutely. Mirroring. It can be yeah. called sometimes, yeah. but that's not Absolutely. what we're talking about here. We're not no, talking about. No. Mirroring. It's, it, it, it's not immutable. I know I keep hitting this. In many ways, accent is not immutable. Otherwise, you know, you, you, no one would know that David Tennant is Scottish. He can play English. He could, you know, you oh, can... absolutely. And I can put on the accent if I need to. Yes, yeah, so I. I. 
I think you need to prove yourself as a working class person much more than people who justify been to. justify yourself yeah. more than prove. You need to justify Absolutely. your presence in yeah. the room where it happens. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. as your last caller said, uh, and that it doesn't matter what you've achieved. This is bringing us back to James Graham. It doesn't matter how much you earn or how much you've no. achieved or no. what your status is. It doesn't change that sense of of, of needing to justify or having to ju- or being required to justify. And listen, uh, uh, the, this is hundreds of years of social conditioning, very deliberate, albeit that it's not literally taught on blackboards. Keeping the lower orders in their place is the only way we could have had a monarchy for the last 1,500 years or however many years. We literally no way that some inbred imbecile can become an earl unless all of the people infinitely cleverer than the inbred imb- imbecile have been somehow persuaded that he is better than them. Uh, it's why it's it's probably why this country's never had a proper revolution. And when it did, about 14 years later, they turned around and put the dead king's son back on the same bloody throne. It is 11.51, and um, attendant on this conversation, just a nod towards Kirsty Allsop's Twitter account, which... Um, Inform some of the conversation we had yesterday uh, in the last hour about anxiety among children. And, and actually, I think inevitably, because I, I think her dad's an aristocrat, isn't he? Um, th- there's probably some class involved in this as well. But the decision uh, to let her 15-year-old boy go travelling on continental Europe uh, with a 16-year-old friend continues to bubble away. Um, she's tweeted this morning, congratulations to the son for having the most negative take on teen travel and totally failing to report any of the amazing life affirming positive tweets you've sent me. No wonder so many people are living in fear when a national newspaper behaves so bizarrely. I, I missed that. She's good, isn't she? So, you know, an endemic of anxiety, not just among young people, but also among adults could perhaps have been contributed to by a commercial media that dedicates its entire existence to trying to frighten you. Look out! Some immigrants! Single mothers! Unemployed people! Everything is designed to frighten you. And we we sit here going, why are we all so anxious? And you'll turn on LBC at a slightly different time of day and someone will be telling you to, to fear everybody who doesn't look exactly like you. Funny old world, isn't it? Uh, back to class. Christopher's in Belfast. Christopher, what made you pick up the phone? Yeah, uh, James, it's nice to speak to you again. This is an area that I've published on, researched on. I, yeah, I remember. On you've, you, and more importantly than any of your <laughs> academic accolades and publications, you've also phoned this program before on yeah. similar territory. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The one thing I wanted to uh, highlight to you is this brilliant English social historian, the most famous one ever, E.P. Thompson, yeah. explained a lot of this really, really well, where he said that class is not an it. It's moving, it's relational, it's immaterial, but it's real. And the way he explains that it's immaterial, but it's real is so good because he says it's like having love. You don't have love without lovers. You don't have deference without lords and peasants. Mm. And the last thing he says about it is that class is not the machine itself. Class is the smell, the noise, the feeling the machine gives off when you're around it. And that's what kind of, I think, encapsulates what a lot of your callers have said about that imposter syndrome, the language, the scapegoating. All the the, the, the noticing, issues. the fact that, that you don't notice or you do. So somebody from my class doesn't notice what somebody working class notices in the same environment, in the same room, in the same moment. No, exactly. And that's where I've noticed that from teaching lots of working class students throughout, you know, a few decades now, that they will be more uh, reticent in the classroom. And you actually have to encourage them a lot more so that they become comfortable Mm. of expressing themselves. And you you can see how how they develop through their, whenever you're teaching them actually and through their learning, how they kind of grow in stature actually and how they begin to understand all those kind of ways of using language that other people who have better education or better education opportunities have gone to better schools that they imbibe naturally. There's another element of this conversation, the difference between education and intelligence. Oh, yeah, no, exactly. exactly. And that's where uh, a previous caller said about Cambridge and Oxford being the best universities. I don't know. I think in knowledge terms, they're probably the best. But in intelligence terms, I'm not convinced about that. No, of course you know, not. I've, I've, met, 
and many other people from other universities, from Russell Group and non-Russell Group, who are just as good, just as intelligent, or better and have more intelligence than the people from Oxbridge. But that's part of the kind of English class system. Yes, in that kind of course of it, is, well. right? it is. It's all about hierarchies, isn't it? Not, not necessarily, obviously, at first glance, a class-based hierarchy, but scratch the surface of it, and that's what you'll find. Any hierarchy is going to have a very intimate relationship with class. Exactly, and that's where that's the kind of last point I would make about that is that class is really about unequal power relationships. I think yeah. you know that it's who has access to the power and doesn't, and those who are like myself from middle class backgrounds, you know, we get access to that power much more easily. We get uh, imbibed into it or drawn into it much more easily than other classes and other groups yeah. in society, and that's why it's um, it's the way the education system is run across the UK and Ireland now in terms of money being so important it, it is criminal it, it to entrenches do that. It. Exactly. It, it, it you never break out of that cycle for as for as long as it exists um do you want to mention anything any of your work to, that, that people no, might no, want to no, read no 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 i've taken far too much time already you're just you're just going to stick with the ep thompson like, wh- wh- which exactly. ep thompson would you go i've read his william blake book which i think was published after he died but i haven't read anything else where, where should we start with our ep thompson studies the making of the English working class what a title. because you'll read you'll read stuff about the Newcastle and Durham miners and about them breaking into mine owners' houses and leaving notes for the mine owners saying about how they drank all their wine <laughs> and they were glad they did. It's just full of so many brilliant things. It really um reading that book ten, fifteen years ago really made me look at the English working class in a totally different uh, fashion and manner. It's such a good uh, book and such a great uh, kind of homage to English working people great and stuff. what they've done throughout centuries. But thank you for your time again. No, really well, no thank, thank you for your time. And, and you could have taken longer if you wanted. Um, interesting. I just saw a clip yesterday of Jacob Reese's pieces recording himself explaining why trade union members shouldn't have got the pay rises that they've received. I don't know why that popped into my mind then when, when, when Christopher was talking, but it is... It's of a piece, isn't it, with much of what we've been discussing. I think his maternal lorry driver, his maternal grandfather, by the way, was a lorry driver. Reese's piece is not, not Christopher. So, you know, what is immutable and what is not is a, a much deeper question than perhaps we realised when we first asked it. Mark's in Dunfermline. Mark, what would you like to say? Um, hi, James. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. What's on your mind? Um, I just on this subject, I think it's, um, some of your previous calls have been uh, really, really good in what they've said. Um, one thing for for me that that, that we all is, um, if you've ever been working class and yeah. you've managed to kind of to kind of drag yourself up a little bit, is you've got this fear. There's always a fear in the back of your head that if the cards fall differently, you know, you could be back there. Um, and you know, you don't have this kind of support network that upper class, middle class people might have grown up with in their family. I, that, 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 Sorry, what you can say? I, well, I, I, I was just making some slightly annoying noises there, Mark, to be oh, honest with you. But, they, but you were right to identify the fact that they were perhaps a precursor to a more articulate contribution. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know that I agree with you. And I can't really argue with you because you're speaking from personal right. experience. And it's a personal mm-hmm. experience I don't have. But I, yeah. but I know that there are people who were born posh who haven't got a pot to pee in and haven't got the, yeah. the, the structure that you describe. And so they wouldn't be working class, but they would have the feeling... Martin Amis used to call it tramp angst, and right, it didn't. It didn't. Okay. It didn't matter how many best-selling books he wrote or how much money he had in the bank. He was yeah. animated by a constant fear that he was going to end up with nothing. That's exactly. That's exactly how I feel, or yes. exactly how I, how I would put it. But what I would say is that what we don't have, or what I don't have, and what my wife doesn't have, as uh, you know, people who grew up in kind of working class families, yeah. working class families living from paycheck to paycheck. We don't have any family members. If we fell on hard times, there's no one we can go and ask for, for help. You know, we well, would be pretty much... On yeah, our, on not, not enough. I mean, you might sofa yeah. surf or something like that, or, or a friend yeah, might put no you up for a couple ask, of weeks. But, yeah, but there's no one I can go and ask, you know. But that's, can, that's, can so, that's, that's, that's status. That's not class. Mm, uh, well, I would... But where, where does the line... Where's the I don't line know. Line, I don't know. That's, that's tomorrow's that. phone-in. Um, I don't know if it is status. I think that is class, but you're more likely to be in that position if you're working class than you would be if you're upper class. I mean, I, you, class. I, I, I mean you, you're, you're highly unlikely to have a friend who has an empty cottage on their estate that you can borrow for a couple of exactly. years if you're working exactly. class. But, but equally... Yeah. 
the the you know there will be people who grew up in incredibly moneyed circumstances who can end mm-hmm. up without anybody to turn to. But yeah, you're, clo- you're closer to it yeah. than I am. But I, I think I, I think it's fifty two percent class, forty eight percent status. It's eleven fifty nine. Thank you, Mark. Um, what an interesting phone. Thank you. I was worried about that one. Because it was quite a weird one, immutable characteristic. What are the immutable characteristics? I could write an E.P. Thompson thesis. What are the immutable characteristics of the working class condition in uh, post-Brexit Britain? Or pre-Brexit Britain. I just wanted to make the title sound a bit fancier than it did before. We'll come back to that. That's, that's great stuff. I might, do you know, I might give old James Graham a ring, actually, and uh, see what his thoughts are on the subject of the immutable characteristics. Great work. Um, that's it, though, for this part of the programme. Time next for Mystery Hour, your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. And if you want to get a question on the board, well, forgive me, but you'd better get your skates on. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. Oh, four minutes after 12 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where I am, well, the switchboard's already full. I warn you to get your flipping skates on, and you've already started moaning about not being able to get through, which means I should probably do a slightly shorter introduction than usual, crack on with the questions, free up some phone lines so that the people moaning now can get through and be told that their question is rubbish. So please vacate the line and uh, allow somebody else to you. I, 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 listen, if you don't know how this part of the programme works, there are... Sometimes at this point in the pro, I just invent a random number and then see if I can fill the spaces available. So I could have said then, there are four things that you need to know. Hmm. The first is that you can win a Mystery Hour board game by being my favourite contributor of the week. Uh, you can find out more about the rather splendid Mystery Hour board game at mysteryhour.co.uk and you can find the full terms and conditions for the competition at lbc.co.uk So that's one thing that you need to know. Uh, what are the other three? I shouldn't have said four. I should have said two. Number Question number two, uh, or rather point number two that you need to know about this is that you're not allowed to look things up. So if someone rings in with a question, don't flip and Google it or get your Encyclopedia Britannica off the shelf. Uh, a, I will usually be able to tell him. B, it makes a mockery of the entire practice. That's all I've got. Why did I say four? Well, is, can you think of anything? Can you think of anything? I've got two things. I used to do, what was that, repetition, but I'm flipping, no chance of me remembering all the things that have come up on this part of the programme before. So I thought I had more than two things. Can't win a game. Don't look stuff up. And, and of course, now what you're thinking is, I thought you said you were going to do a shorter introduction than usual so that you could get... Yeah, don't don't trust the word I say. That, no, that, that can't work. That's not... Oh, all right. I'll see if I can come up with a couple more. Uh, six minutes after 12 is the time. So, so people... Ring, well, I suppose you need to know the rules, don't you? So people ring in with a question. There you go. That's point three. And then point four, people ring in with an answer. Boom! Tsh! Fantastic. Uh, and it's, I mean, hopefully it already sounds extremely exciting, but p- perhaps it, it doesn't. So you will need to wait and see. I don't use texts either, but that, there you go. That's how it all starts. Oh, and the motoring one. Thank you, Becky. I've kind of stepped back from the motoring one. Although I was listening to a conversation about 20 mile per hour speed limits earlier, and I found myself revisiting the determination never to discuss anything motoring related on the radio up to and including on Mystery Hour, except for this. Do you think there's a topic? Right, don't text me. Well, no, you have to text me. Don't ring me. Would it be fair to say that the only people who get really exercised and upset about councils introducing 20 mile per hour speed limits are the kind of people you'd be gutted to sit next to at a party? Is that an, is that an utterly unreasonable suggestion to make? Have we done it? Did we try and do it as a topic? I don't know whether we've done some things. Anyway, I digress slightly because Mystery Hour is upon us. Your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. And and listen, if it's a really obvious question, like baby pigeons or white dog poo, you won't get on. So don't waste your time and mine and Eleanor's by ringing in with questions such as those. Should we start? 12.07? It's a bit shorter than usual. Uh, Ian's in hollow. Ian, question or answer? Question. Carry on. 
why do some of the best dramas from across the world insist on using empty takeaway coffee cups? Health and safety. Why? Well, here's what I think. So what you're talking about is Inspector Barnaby goes into a yep. cafeteria and buys a coffee, and then you, being an eagle-eyed television viewer with a peculiar interest in takeaway coffee cups and their contents or lack thereof, you then notice from the way he is carrying the cup, its relationship with gravity and muscle tone, that it's empty. Yeah, so they're, they're doing a brilliant piece of convincing you that they're Inspector Barnaby. Yes. But there's, there's no weight to the coffee cup that they're holding. Yes. There's no heat in it. It doesn't have the cardboard sleeve that some outlets give you to protect your hands in case you don't have alabaster fingers. Yes. So, so the director is saying, convince me that you're Inspector Barnaby, but don't worry about the fact that you're clearly not cu- carrying a proper cup of coffee. Did you say alabaster fingers? Alabaster fingers, yeah. If you my, got, first, if you alab- my first band was called the Alabaster Fingers. <laughs> well, that's what my mum used to say. It's a beautiful why, phrase. Why she was able to get stuff out of the out of the oven without using other gloves. She had alabaster um, fingers. What saying, a beautiful, yeah. beautiful phrase. <laughs> oh, bless your mum. Because she could have Back said asbestos, and that would have had no romance oh. to it whatsoever, would it? Also, yeah, you know, health connotations. She was from so, so you know, you know. Alabaster they, they, always, they always had trouble with their words. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to take a round of applause for this one, but I think it's... I mean, the health and safety side of it is probably the reason why they don't have the sleeves. So they don't put a boiling hot drink in a cup, which admittedly yeah. breaks the fourth wall for you. It breaks the... And the reason why they're but even empty, if it was cold, it would have weight to it. Yeah. Maybe it was... for They do more than one take. Yeah. So maybe they've actually had a nice sip of it. I, was I reading something the other day about... I can't remember what it was. So it may be that the cup starts full but not hot. But yeah. quite often the, 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 the take that makes the final edit is the cup by then is empty. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, who's going to tell us? We need, we need Neil Dodgen to ring in. Who is or, the, or Inspector Barnaby? These, know, they've all got different names, haven't they? Best boys or grips or whatever. I yeah, well, I mean, well, no, I mean, because the no. first thing is they might say it's not true. It's it's not true that this is, or it might be obvious. It can, you know. My wife and I regularly sit watching low, particularly crime dramas, because it's always it is always the love uh, a crime drama. Police walk, walk, love walk a crime away drama. From, what are you enjoying um, at the moment? Are you enjoying anything uh, in particular? Well, a, a lot, a lot of it is uh, is really watching Blue Bloods in terms of American TV Tom, yeah. and Line of Duty in right. terms of oh, quite, yeah. you know. But but we'll say, oh, that was that was brilliant, and then we'll look at each other and say, empty cups, empty cups, yeah, empty cups, just 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 spoils it for us. Yeah, just I can see why. Actually, it breaks the spell. It, it genuinely breaks the spell. I, I, I like that question. Someone will know. Someone who works on set. Um, that surely they could have at least put cold liquids in it and then you might still have problems with the absence of a sleeve but you could have put a sleeve on a cold there you go problem solved why don't they put a cold liquid in a cup with a sleeve and then ian and his wife will be able to watch their crime dramas in in relative harmony and peace Twelve eleven is the time uh matt's in worthing matt question or answer hello james question please carry on matt I- I do agree with you, and that is upsetting when you see an empty cup. Upsetting's like going quite far. That's quite a strong uh, word to use. In this. Uh, Dis- uh, yeah, I'd, go, I'd say distracting. I don't know that I'd say upsetting. <laughs> Mildly disturbing. Mildly disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> discombobulating. It's discombobulating. Yeah, that's the one. Let's go with that. <laughs> go on. So, um, my question is: You're sitting there and you're enjoying a Kit Kat, yeah, and um, suddenly you get an incredible pain into your brain, and you've bitten down on a bit of tin foil onto your amalgam filling, which yes. is probably caused by the Kit Kats you've been eating. Yeah, and it's just what is that all about? It's insane Why? in the membrane, is what it is. <laughs> It is. It is. It's. it's I, I haven't done it for a long time. Did you ever do it on purpose when you were little? When you first got a feeling, did you ever kind of? Uh, no, no, just, no. I never did it on purpose, but I did do it um, mistakenly, accident. and did it you, was always. It's a really uh, odd, in, 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 almost indescribable sensation, unlike anything else that you've had. If you bite down on foil with an amalgam filling. Yes, and like a lot of young people wouldn't understand that probably these days because they. Do you still have amalgam better. fillings? I do have a couple. Do you? Um, they must be old. A few. Re- 
Oh, yeah, I'm the same age as you, James. Yeah, I but mean, it doesn't know, mean the feelings are the same age, does it? But you're saying, <laughs> but I did, I did, um, I did, you know, eat a lot of sugar when I was younger. Unfortunately. I think I swapped mine out for a posher version. I think. Yeah, but you're richer than me, so. Uh, well, you know, yeah, also, I'm now. more. It's not a class, I'm more gullible than you. So I've sat in the dentist chair, <laughs> and he's gone. Would you like me to swap these old amalgams for something a bit more expensive? I've gone. All right, all right, all right, all right. Whereas you've gone. Absolutely not. I'm perfectly happy with my amalgams. I want to yeah, know when I've accidentally been. bitten down on a bit of Kit Kat wrapper, which doesn't apply anymore because <laughs> they don't come wrapped in foil. So no one knows what we're right. talking about. <laughs> Nobody under the age of 40 has got a clue what we're talking They don't have any experience of foil-wrapped Kit Kats and they don't know what an amalgam filling is. I know, exactly. Apart from that, great question. They'll never never understand that sensation, (laughs) They'll they'll never understand that (laughs) sensation. I'll tell you what it is, Matt. It's very upsetting. It is very disturbing. <laughs> Not to mention discombobulating, mate. Very discombobulating. It's 12.14. <laughs> What's going on then? And obviously, you've got to understand the question to provide an answer, and I do understand the question. Nigel is in Hounslow. Nigel, question or answer? It, it's a question, James. Carry on, Nigel. Yeah, as part of my exercise regime when, when I go to the gym, yeah. I, 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 I go in the swimming pool, and yes. after a few lengths to standard breaststroke, I then walk... Uh, forwards and backwards along the length of the pool. And what I found is <clears throat> that it, I, I feel I'm walking much faster backwards. <laughs> so I then time myself against the actual clock on, on the wall. Thank you for doing and the doing the research before research, ringing in. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. No, an anecdote is not evidence, James. No, it's not. Thank you. Is that, this is. is that, this is evidence. Yeah, no, the plural of anecdote is not data. That's what we usually say. But anyway, it doesn't matter. This is data and anecdote. <laughs> so go on. You timed yourself. You timed yourself walking. What happened? <laughs> well, I found I found that uh, I was actually um, my, my standard time for, for walking forwards was thirty seconds. Yeah. And I walked backwards. It was actually twenty-seven seconds, which is almost a saving of ten percent. Yeah. It so is. That's what, is that a width? Is that a width or a length? A width. A width. A width. Oh, it's, it's length. Length. A, le- length. It's a length. length. Quite a short pull, then. No, I'm quite a fast walk, James. You, you know, oh, you, I hadn't you thought of that. Of course, it's one or the other, isn't it? Yeah, you make you make a false assumption. James, I did. Yeah, much. you're not. You're not right. Well, I, you, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, forwards or backwards. That's a fair old lick that you've got going on there. Exactly, and and I said a three second difference. So I thought, hold on, maybe there's something. About my particular physiology that's doing this. Yes. So I then, I then asked my, 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 my fellow people in, in, the, in, the, in the pool. Yes. No, friendly, if, if they mind you know, being part of the experiment. And, and the results were consistent. How, you know, how did you to, phrase that question? How did you make that in, invitation, that offer to your... I mean, did, oh, Jake, you know, you know, don't know, you know, it's easy. Hey, look, mate, can I ask you a question? Right? Yeah. I'm finding that, that when I walk forwards, right... I'm actually slower than when I'm walking backwards. Oh, Would you right. mind just yeah. confirming that through actually doing the same thing as me? Pardon? What, what, what do you want me to do? You want me to walk? Way, sorry? Who's, are you going to time me while I walk forwards in the swimming pool and then time me again when I walk backwards? Yeah. Yeah. Don't mind. Guard! You. Guard! Lifeguard! <laughs> like, <laughs> over here! Quick! <laughs> and and, and uh, that, how many people contributed, participated in well, the... Well, 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 I had a few refusals. And I did it really? Two. Really? Don't you surprise me, Nigel? <laughs> 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 but, but over a period of like, you know, a couple of weeks, I had at least, at least oh, no, I said at least 10 did uh, it, and, and the results were consistent. Oh. The saving, I mean, they, well, you know, they weren't as fast as me generally, because I'm quite fast. Evidently. But yeah, the, we've established that. Stop showing off. Yeah, 10%. 10%. But, but, so 10%. Faster walking backwards in a swimming pool than walking forwards. Yes, this is one of my favourite ever questions. What happens in the deep end? No, no I'm, 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 I'm in a posh pool, James. I don't go to council pool. Oh, okay. Sorry, oh, oh it's, it's a fancy, fancy pants pool. All right, fancy we're back pool. to class now. It comes into I said, didn't I? It comes into everything, class, and yeah, there class, we are. Now. Class, is, class is purely an action of mind. It's, 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 it's purely an action of mind. Right, we know it isn't. We established that in the last hour, but now we will establish using the power of science why. Everybody in Nigel's swimming pool walks faster backwards than they do forwards. It's 12.17. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. Call 0345 6060 973. It is 12.19 and this has caused something of a furore. Furore? Furore? Rumpus. Ruckus. Um, Ian is far from alone. 
in his discombobulation at the deployment of empty cups in television dramas, Gat Gray tells me, Coronation Street always have empty cups, exclamation mark. I thought it was only me that noticed this, exclamation mark. Uh, Tins writes, empty cups agree. Also, obviously empty suitcases. Yeah, that's true as well. Um, Chris says, I can't stand empty cups. Just put some liquid in it, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Double exclamation. Just put some liquid in it. And uh, Adam says, the empty coffee cup thing is a real and huge bugbear of mine. They are definitely empty. I think it's because it's a prop that they reuse. It still winds me up. Hashtag, hashtag, no more empty cups. This is kicked off. How will it end? Hopefully with a phone call from someone that works on television programmes and can tell us why they use empty cups. Alex is in Milton Keynes. Alex, question or answer? Answer, James, to the cups. Oh, um, happy and- days. Carry on. And it does bother me as well. Um, But simply, as you said, it's one is health and safety. Can't have, obviously, water on set. Oh, because of all the electrics? Yeah, because of all the electrics, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens if someone spills the drink over the costume? You then got to wait for either have a replacement Continuity. Continuity. And wait for it to dry. Even if it's just plain water, you'll have a clear wet patch. Yep. So, so health and safety and con- and continuity and, and technology as well. Well, yeah. that doesn't explain why the suitcase has to be empty. But to yeah, be fair, that, suitcase, no, that's, that's not the question. That, that's not the question yeah. that was asked. And if it's in a glass, so the pl- set, the places where you cannot do this would be if they started serving pints in the Rovers' return in in opaque glasses. Everyone yeah. would go. It would distract even more to have yeah. pints not being served in glasses. Yeah. But then it would uh, run the risk of of the things going wrong that you've described going wrong in a pub. Yeah, exactly that. So always, exactly it, given right. given the choice, they're always going to put it in a mug or a cup. Qualifications? Yeah, I'm an actor. Well, have you have you ever used a cup on set? Um, on, in, in character, in short, character, in, my, in character, my own short films, I do. I do try and be a bit crafty and do put water in. It bugs me. Yes. But sometimes I get told off and get told to empty it. Can't be doing it. Round of applause for Alex. No. It's got to be that. Yep. Well played, mate. 21 after 12. Uh, 0345 606973 is the number that you need uh, to answer the questions that remain, which are Matt's tooth and Nigel's swimming pool behaviour. Uh, Isaac's in Westminster. Isaac, question or answer? I've got a question, please. Carry on, Isaac. Uh, when they're restoring black and white photos yeah. or video, yeah. how do they know the exact colour based on just grey? Um, how can they not, find out what's It's not there? just grey, is it? But if there was like a dark red T-shirt or a dark blue T-shirt, yes. if you took a black and white photo, it would look exactly the same. I'm not sure it would. I think there are at least 50 shades of grey. <laughs> are there? <laughs> But sorry, that was really poor, and also quite, <laughs> quite. But no, there are. I think I think this has come up before, and I think there will be some guesswork involved. But for example, you're not going to make someone's face green, are you? No. And you know that buses are red. So what? I mean, in fact, I may leave it on the board. But the more I think about it, the more we could actually work it out together. So there are some things. Here is a black and white photograph of Piccadilly Circus in 1914. All right. Yeah. What color are the buses? Red. Right. So you find that shade of grey, that precise shade of grey, and using the technology at your disposal, you colour in everything else in the picture that is that precise shade of grey, red. Okay. And and then you find, what colour is that taxi over there? Black. So you find that precise shade of grey all over the... Are you shaking your head at me, Adam? What? We're not. So what do you mean the shadows? They didn't come along until the sixties after Cliff Richard got famous. So then you get then you get the black cabs. You fill in all the black cabs. That precise shade of grey, and and that's what. What's that about an eighth of the picture done already? Take a rough guess at skin colour. Colour everyone else in relatively similarly, and then you'll have some people who are um, noticeably darker. So you can do that, and so that is how I think you do it. And then shadows. You know, is that pack. always going to be precise, though? No, I don't think it is going to be precise. I think it's, I think it's going to be pretty impressive and plausible, but not precise. I don't see how it can be precise. 
so it's when you restore the photo, it's not actually how it was taken. Uh, no, I don't think it would be exactly reflective of what the photographer saw that day. Uh, Bernard in Croydon tells me, and I've got no way of checking this, that there are in fact 257 shades of grey on the black and white photo palette going from black to white. So there's 257 stops from black to white. So if you could isolate and identify all of those and then marry the ones that you know are going to be red or black or, you know, in the case of buildings, you could have a fair crack at it, although probably the buildings would be more polluted then than they are. That, that I think, is... I'm getting a lot of abuse for this one. I've got to tell you. I, said, I thought I was doing really well, but Mark says, stop, just stop. Beatrice says, I think you are talking rubbish. Um, Liz is not being helpful. She says London buses weren't read until 1933. She's completely missing the point. Um, so I could be wrong. That, that Mark says, surely it's a much more automated process converting something. If you spent all day going through colours of buses, etc., it would leave it much more subjective than what is surely an automated process. So the conclusion is, Isaac, I... I've just wasted three minutes of your life, for which I can only I can only apologise. I thought the shadows joke was quite good. Uh, hopefully, that made it all worthwhile. And I will now put your question on the board. No, thank you. No, thank you. So, how do they know what colour to colour when they are colouring a black and white photograph? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Dan's in uh, Pencord in Wales. That's uh, close to Pencoid. Pencoid, nearly, <laughs> nearly. Uh, question or answer? Nearly. Uh, question. Go on. So, beer and bread are pretty much like cornerstones of early civilization. Yeah. But you can't make those without yeast. Yeah. And I just can't figure out how they started putting yeast into stuff. Like, where does it come from? And why did they decide this weird moldy thing should go in stuff and then just leave it out to rise? It's a very good question. I mean,. I think things fermented by accident, didn't they? But then if you've left something out in the sun, letting it go like that, whose idea is it then, oh, you know what, I'll give cooking it a go? No, but this is the point. I think at the heart of your inquiry is that humanity has been around for so long, it's tried everything. You, you watch a child, they'll put anything in their mouth. And, and I genuinely think, you know, someone milked a horse once and yeah. drank it. Someone decided that they were going to eat that mushroom and they died. And someone decided they were going to eat that mushroom and they saw angels. And someone decided that they were going to eat that mushroom and it was delicious. So, it, it, you know, there's, a, there's, there's millennia of trial and error based upon the human proclivity for putting things in our mouths. And also hunger. So you would know that something was filling you up and something wasn't. So if I forget, for example, to take my smoothie out of my rucksack when I get home and I leave it in my rucksack, Sometimes, perhaps, maybe on a Friday, I might leave it until the Sunday. When I open it, it nearly explodes. It's fizzed up. It's fermented. So that, I think, is how they discovered fermentation. You know, not by using a flask in a rucksack, but by watching what happens when a pig eats rotten apples under a tree and thinking, cool, that pig looks happy. I'll try it. So, so some of it is going to be trial and error. And I think, that, I think this is where my theory falls down. Because where does the yeast come in? That's the question. And from that point, they've then figured out, okay, so we've got this thing. Yeah. Where are they then getting it from? Well, I'll tell you what I think happened. It's a, Yeast is a naturally occurring fungus, right? Right. And, and they, they were making bread, which they just essentially involved putting things in your mouth. And then a few generations later, along came fire. So they're making flat bread now. Yeah, don't shake your head at me. I'm just going to have a quick word with my colleagues. This is this is good stuff, this. So they're making flatbreads, right, without any yeast in them from corns in the fields and things. Ready? Yeah. Sourdough, I think, and, and some Belgian beers are made without yeast, but that's, that's by the by. And then, right, in the flour that they are using and that they've learnt to mill to make their flatbreads, some fungus naturally occurred. Yeah? Yeah. And when they cook the bread with the flour in which the fungus, a.k.a. yeast, naturally occurred, the, f the bread became quite fluffy and pleasant. 
I, I can accept that. I don't get how they can go from the point of having that yeast in it and have it. Cause well, then, you know then how, they how decided, then smelled. the next day they used some other flour from a different cave and it was back to being flat again. So they realised that the flour in the, in the other cave, something was happening to it that created the fluffy bread. So they started keeping all their flour in the other cave where this naturally occurring fungus would occur. Did you listen to the last hour? I didn't, know. Ah, that's a shame, because Christopher in Belfast was explaining how if you go to public school, you can sound incredibly convincing, even when you're talking absolute twaddle. That sounds like this. I think that's exactly what we're currently going through at the moment, so I'll stop again. I did it two, two calls. In fact, Mystery Hour is probably the best example imaginable of what Christopher in Belfast was talking about. But I, there might be some truth in it. I shall find out for you. How did we, how did we know, how did humans do yeast? Tim Humphrey has your headlines. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. 33 minutes after 12 is the time. I'd read out that text saying that there's no yeast in sourdough. And even as I was reading it, I thought back to lockdown when everyone I know started making sourdough and thought there is yeast in sourdough. So I apologies for reading that out. I misled you on that. All the other stuff about caves, flour... Black and white, that was all true. Uh, I did not at all an exercise in a public schoolboy sounding incredibly plausible while talking utter, utter gibberish. We shall see. So only one round of applause so far, and that was for the cups on the television sets. Tony's in Chelsea. Tony, question or answer? Hi there, James. It's Hello. an answer. Carry on. And Tony. may I also congratulate you on the Shadows joke. I'm a Shadows fan, and, uh, you know, I... It gets better. Agree. It gets better. <laughs> it gets better, Tony. Go on. Guess who just got in touch to, to to express similar appreciation of that Shadows joke? Oh, not uh, one of the Shadows. Not like, quite. Bruce, instance... Bruce's son, Dwayne. Bruce Welsh's oh, son, right, Dwayne. Right, you right. Go, James, you just mentioned my dad <laughs> on Mystery <laughs> Hour. I nearly crashed the car. <laughs> it's like my own personal <laughs> Ray Liotta. Look at that, yeah, eh? Well, excellent, Fantastic. Excellent. Carry on. Yeah, it couldn't be better. It couldn't be better. Right, so um, um, I have an answer, and the answer is to the question about why you used to get that feeling of... Uh, Extreme pain. Yes. If you, um, that's a very specific a sensation. Of... Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it certainly is uh, because it's hitting the nerve with a small amount of electricity caused by the electrolytic action between the silver paper and mercury amalgam uh, fillings. Does it need so, to have mercury in it, or just well, any metal? To, um, t- I think any metal would do, but they used uh, mercury amalgam for a. Wow. Uh, a, a reason that I'm not absolutely sure about, but um, yeah. So, so, so it's a it's tiny electric. little electric shock go, j- being conducted through the metal filling into the nerve below the filling. That's right. Oh yeah, you know, I, 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 I just got the, I, yeah, I got it then. I didn't get it, get it, but I got it, got it. If you see what yeah. I mean. Ooh, well, I'll oh, stop that's you from great. Kit Kats. <laughs> yeah, qualification. Any, any sweet, any sweet would would um, uh, be a good thing not to eat. But uh, uh, if uh, anybody uh, manufacturing sweets is advertising you, then take no notice. Yes, metal, metal, it's the metal. So I don't think you have anything foil wrapped these days, unless you've wrapped it yourself. But back in the day, the Kit Kat would be wrapped in foil, and if some of the, if you bit on the foil. Then you'd get an electric. It was an electric current passing through into the. That's right. Um, that's right. Well, fantastic exactly. stuff. What are your qualifications, Tony? I'm a physicist. A physicist. Well, that'll do. Round of applause for Tony, the physicist. <laughs> Top man. Excellent. That's what I live for. No, oh, no, well, good. Physicist. Oh, you got it Round there. You got a bit. You got. A, you got a, a shadows-related anecdote to amaze your friends with later, and you got a mystery a round of applause as well. Today's a good day, Tony. Stephen's in Harrow. Stephen, question or answer? Uh, it's a question. Carry on. Why don't we eat swans? Well, I mean, speak for yourself. Have you have you tasted swan? You're not you're not allowed to eat a swan, are you? In this country, I think I did have yeah. a. I think well, I made. Don't we have a swan in Czechoslovakia? I may be imagining it. Anyway, I, well, let's not go there now. I think they all belong to the king, don't they? The swans? I believe they do in this country, but I'm interested to know why the king owns all the swans here to stop them being eaten and why we can't eat swans anywhere else because I've never seen it on the menu anywhere. Well, you're only allowed one question. I think they had them in Tudor times. I think they ate swans in Tudor times. I think I think my visit to Hampton Court, I could have imagined it, but I'm fairly confident that a swan... They also used to do that thing, didn't they, where you had a swan... 
and and then inside it a peacock, and then inside the peacock a goose, and inside the goose a duck, and inside the duck a chicken, and inside the chicken a quail, and inside the quail a poussin, and inside yeah. the poussin a I don't know a Kinder surprise. But you, you, you I, I don't. So we can only have one question. So, so we need to think what that question is going to be because you can't say why don't we eat swans because the answer to that is because they all belong to the king and you're not allowed to eat the king's swans. So why do well, all the swans belong to the king is the question I think we no, want. It's broader than that. I Go think, on then. Why don't, why don't humans eat swans? They do. Humans do eat swans. Where? Eastern Europe. I've never seen that. Where have you ever okay, been? Why do all the swans belong to the king? Have you ever been to Eastern Europe? Which bits have you been to? I've been to quite a few bits of Eastern Europe. Well, um, and, and, and have you ever asked if they eat swans? I've never seen it on the menu. Well, how hard have you looked? Do you know? Do you know the Do you know the Serbo Croat word? Do you know the Serbian word for swan? No. No. I've been to China, and they have everything on the menu there, but I've never seen swan there. This is true. I'm, I, all right, I'm going to put a variety of questions on the board, <laughs> in, including, and I don't do this very often, but I, my curiosity has now been piqued. So why do all the swans belong to the king, and do they eat swans anywhere? So this question's my swan song, I guess. Oh, that, geez, that's good. <laughs> no, that is good. Well played, Stephen. 12.38 is the time. Uh, why do all the swans belong to the king, and do they eat swans anywhere? In fact, no. Stephen, come back. Let's go all in on this, mate. The only person we want to hear from, am I right, is someone who's eaten a swan. Well, yeah. What does it taste like? That's what we want to know. Chicken, probably. That's what we want to know. That's that's it. So that, that so the first question is a normal mystery hour question, which anyone can answer if they know the answer. And the question yeah. is, why, do, why does this king own all the swans? The second question is very specific. Have you ever eaten a swan? Legally, I don't want any... Traitors, don't want any treason on the programme. Tw- not on a Thursday. 12.39 is the time. Uh, Bryn's in Litchfield. Bryn, question or answer? It's an answer, James. Carry on, Bryn. Uh, it's one for your beer, bread, yeast, yeast question. Excellent. Yeah, the yeast thing. You're, I mean, everyone's going to hate that you were kind of right. Yeah, I knew that. Um, Do you know... I, 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 yeah, go on, sorry. I know, I was just going to say, there is, there is an argument. I worked in beer, and there's an argument about what came first, bread or beer. Yes. In beer, everyone says it's beer. Uh, in, in Africa, people were burying things in the sand, in, in the ground, just to make them kind of last longer, yeah. hide them away as you do with your food. People found it went bubbly. They put long reeds in to drink the liquid that was in there. Wow. Made them get drunk. They liked it. They carried on doing the same thing. Um, so that's how, that's kind of how beer was originally created. Makes perfect and, sense. Yeah. And, and it is, when you talk about Belgian beer, you say there's no yeast added. It actually is because it comes in from the air. They pump it up to the top of a brewery oh. into a thing called a cool ship, open all the windows. The yeast then inoculates it naturally and they leave it for a lot longer than you'd leave a commercial beer to then become alcoholic and beer. I am never going to read another text from Richard who said there was no yeast in in sourdough bread or in Belgian beer. I think he might have meant <laughs> soda no, bread, but anyway. And, and I think it's no added yeast as well because they don't add it. And do you want to know another little fact that people in beer say? God, yeah. Um, that, um, so the reason why you have the term magic wand and witches is because when, um, when you were making beer and you didn't understand what yeast was and where it came from, they put all sorts of ingredients into things to try and flavour it. And one time someone put a stick in it, big stick, and it worked, and it made beer. So they oh. put the same stick in the next batch. Next batch. Of course, that, that stick had the right yeast on it to make the beer. So they kept. Uh, so they thought it was magic. It. So they thought it was magic. So that was the magic. Egyptians, I think. Yeah, so you had a magic wand. That's from that. And also, in the medieval times, women were mostly brewers. Like maybe even like a time, women brewed at home, made beer at home. Yeah. When the church wanted to make some money, they took all the brewing in-house into churches and called all the women witches and said, you can't, they're making magic. You can't have magic. Ama- I mean, this me. is a fantastic catalogue of beer-related n- I spent nuggets. a long time learning about it. I, I can see, <laughs> I'm glad your time wasn't wasted. But what about bread? Where, 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 did, where did yeast and bread, did you think that was just an accident that happened and then got yeah, wrecked? It's, it's the same thing. So it's the, as you said about experimentation, yep. humans will add anything to anything. So it kind of is, right, they, they, they mulched it together when it didn't make a liquid and it made a dough and they stored it away. 
And it, and it rose. And it rose. Yeah, it rose. Yeah, it made more food in a way. So and then great. they we'll cooked it yeah, and it was deli- that, yeah. delicious and, and, and sustaining. Yeah, pretty much. Qualifications? Uh, I worked in the beer and brewing industry for 12 years and I currently work in the wine industry. It's the same thing with Fantastic. wine and yeast. Round of applause for Bryn. Lovely answer. That. I, do you know, I knew, I, I, obviously I was making it up as I went along, but with a, but with a, with a patina of plausibility that I felt was quite persuasive. Thank you, Bryn. Uh, Rostan is in Kensington. Rostan, question or answer? Um, there was a question, James. Yes. Um, yeah, well, I've got a garden and um, I'm a bit of green finger, if you call it. Um, yeah. I do pick plants and stuff. And so obviously when it comes to autumn, you know, leaves are start falling, you know, it's just start changing the... You know the the way the the plant is going, and yeah. then they understand from the weather. But what about indoor plants? I've got an indoor plant. Yeah, which they're all same temperature. They not uh, they not just near the window, so they don't sense the sun outside. But they they just in the autumn start the leaves start going down, and then you know becomes uh, you know yellowish, and then they fall in the winter. They are quiet, and then they start blooming. In the spring, without even knowing, you know, how they got, they got Google Calendar or something? Or? So you mean that because they're indoors, you're confident that the temperature is the same for the whole year, for 12 months of the year? That's right, yeah. How, I don't how, know that how, it how is, it though. Is. I don't know that it is. The sunlight is going to be different coming through the windows, and it's probably... But I know, actually, it might, won't necessarily be warmer than when you've got the, got the central heating on, will it? Yeah, no, no, it's not. Well, what it is, there's some plants I, I'm talking about. They are like in the bathroom, where it's, where it's just like always same. There is no, you know, there is always same situation on all the plants in all over the, you know, house. So, do plants have an internal calendar? Is what we're asking, really? Yeah, that's right. How they sense the, you know, seasonal changing, and then they start blooming in the spring without without any changes in. You know, because in the summer, you know, I've got a temperature, you know, sense, sensor in the home. And I can see always the same. You know, it can get too hot in the summer. But what about the spring? Because the spring, we've still got, you know, things going on. It's, it's a bit of, you know, it's a mystery. It is a mystery. And that's why it's on Mystery Hour. Great. Yes. Perfect. Let's find out. Right, so do, do indoor plants have a, a kind of internal calendar? Because he's right. They do um, kind of... Seem to follow the seasons, even though they're not exposed to the seasons enough to make the seasons be the reason why they seem to be following the seasons. Thank you, Ross. And it's twelve forty-five. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. This is LBC. Twelve forty-seven is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the questions continue. In fact, they need answers, don't they? Um, well, Nigel walking backwards in the swimming pool. Surely someone can help. How come he and his ten fellow swimmers, uh, with a special shout out to all the people who politely uh, declined the invitation to join his weird experiment, uh, the pe- why do, why do they all walk quicker underwater backwards than they do forwards? Uh, Isaac's question about photos Dan's question about yeast I feel we've done uh, have you ever eaten a swan and or why does the king own all the swans and it's going to be the length of the day I should I should, Ross Dan's question about how houseplants know what the season is given that their temperature remains the same throughout unless they've got no window at all the length of the day is going to be communicating something I don't know I'll leave that on the board as well Ivor's in Ilf, Ilford Ivor question or answer answer carry on Ivor Yes, they do with your black and white film question. Oh, excellent. It's, yes, it's all to do with light reflection off of an object. Okay? Yeah. So if you've got, uh, you're going back to your Piccadilly Circus and a black taxi, that's going to absorb light and you'll get less reflection. Yes. And then the buses, whether they were green or red, doesn't absorb as much light, so you get a better reflection and the film can see the difference of shades, and the amount of light that's bouncing off of an object. If we, if there was no light source, i.e., if you took two t- two people, put them in a black room with no light, one wearing a black t-shirt and one wearing a white t-shirt, we still wouldn't see the white t-shirt because there's no light being reflected. Does that answer it? I don't know that it does. I mean, it's very interesting anyway. But in terms of how the restorer knows what. I mean, is, are you, have you just given us a better understanding of the 157 shades of grey? 
Yeah, to, to a point. Um, it's so, well, I mean, how, how, how would I know? Though. How would I know in a black and white photo whether the bus was red or green? You wouldn't. You're just as you said. Your yeah. brain is yeah. it's an assumption of your brain. So they'll do some of it by human spec, human intelligence. They'll say, "Well, the taxis yeah. are going to be black," and then when they can and they can use the technology now to take that shade of grey or that lack of light and yeah. and fill in all the other bits that look that are identical. They can fill all of them in black. Yeah. But it's all, it's all to do with, if you want to call it a light source, or if we said the sun. No, I get it's that. The, I get that. I get that. But it's, 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 he's more, in, Isaac was more interested in the restored pictures, you know, the ones that were black and white, and then they get restored. Some of the victims of the Holocaust, for example, the, the, when they're, when those photographs are restored, they, they're absolutely chilling, chilling, because it suddenly okay. looks like it happened yesterday rather than a hundred... But when you say ago. restored, are you talking about turning a black and white photo yeah. into a colour yeah. image? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Just the, that's the computer guessing. Yeah, that's, that's what it. I thought. I did that, a little group shot of, uh, funny enough, my parents and myself and my sister at a, yeah. a, a, a wedding. And it was black and white, I clicked the button, and it from, I suppose, the shape of yeah. our faces. He knew we were what we term as white people. Caucasian. I hope that doesn't upset go Caucasian. Thank yeah. you very much. And my sister oh, said, but my dress wasn't, it, it should have been red. It was red velvet, and it came up with like a grey. Yeah. Said, because the computer doesn't know. It's just a computer making. Yeah, but if you did know it was red, you could yeah. fill it in as red. And then all oh, the yeah, other definitely. bits that yeah, were the all the, time. all the bits that were the, <laughs> the same shade of grey, you'd fill in as red as well, and you'd get an ever more realistic picture, wouldn't you? Yeah, certainly. But what are your qualifications? Reason, uh, I'm a very keen amateur photographer, and I do own a camera shop, but that doesn't make me an expert, does it? I think it bloody does, <laughs> Ivor. How long have you owned a camera yeah. shop for? Uh, since well, since 2008, but I've been in the camera business for 30 years. Yeah, I think you're an expert. You can have a round of applause, anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, thanks. thank you very much. That's a lovely answer. I like, and I, and I was right. So on both sides, can I just have a quick word with the producer? Because the producer wrote on the board, "This is very public school person explaining things." Guess, guess what? I was right about both of them. I did. I would, I would have done if you hadn't embarrassed me by making me think that I was being an arrogant, pompous public school boy. I'd have got to that point eventually. So be careful, you know, be careful j jumping to conclusions about people. Uh, Andrew's in Banbury. Andrew, question or answer? It's an answer. Carry on, Andrew. It's about the swan. Basically, my brother-in-law yeah. um, was out walking the dog. The swan flew into some pylons. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. Um, my brother-in-law, being him, um, took it home. Right. Contacted the palace, and apparently, the king only owns the swans. At, well, it was the queen at the time. Yeah. Um, I can't believe she answered but, the phone. Well, no, no this was a letter. Um, but they so only a, own swans on the Thames, so he had to contact Defra. Yeah. And then we had a medieval um, party with the whole family. Right. Um, and we ate the swan, and it tastes like beef. I, I I think you I, I think it's all open water. What do you mean by open water? Uh, open water as opposed to closed water. In the rhythm of arts, a bond that never falls apart. Through the highs and through the lows, together our connection grows. Our connection grows. From childhood dreams to grown-up schemes We navigate life's endless dreams Hand in hand we face the night Side by side we find the light No, we're just talking about the Thames. I don't. I, I think that's the general presumption. But I mean, your brother-in-law found the palace, so, the so they gave him per, they gave him permission to eat the, the dead. They gave him permission to eat the dead swan. Yeah, well, yeah. but it was from Defra, not from the palace. Oh, okay. And because and how did Yorkshire. who plucked it? 
Um, John did. John bucked it, and with the, I mean, it must have been a bit of a squeeze in the oven, no? Um, well, I don't know, crikey, it was pretty skinny by the time. Strangely Actually, beefy, uh, and and because and yeah. I heard it was quite a fishy taste, a swan. Well, I don't know, it's beefy. Beefy. But it might be because it was like eight months getting round to actually having permission to eat the swan. Where did, and he kept it in the freezer, did he? Yeah. I think that's a fairly comprehensive answer, Andrew. I, I, yeah. I mean, you didn't develop a taste for it or anything like that. No, it was just the swan with a bit of salad. A um, bit of salad? I wouldn't recommend swan. It's not tasty. And that really is, is the answer to um, Stephen's original question. In, I mean, it, that, like a lot of things, it might have been a bit of a delicacy in medieval times. And I'm getting a couple of messages telling me they still eat them in Denmark. Um, but if it was nice, we probably would would eat it a lot. Yeah, let's just say our family has not eaten swan since the medieval party. I'm very glad. I'm glad we've cleared that up because your secret's safe with me since the medieval. Before you go, what else did you do to enforce the medieval theme? Apart from eating a swan. And we just all dressed up as medieval people, so we had a... Um, Codpiece? I, I, I went as Braveheart. Is that medieval? Okay. I'm not sure that's medieval. That's no, but you just like, you like medieval, wearing a kilt. But, why, should, why not, yeah. eh? Why not? Oh, well, Andrew, have a round of applause. Is John <laughs> still, John's still with us, is he? Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I'll give him my best, won't you? Take care. Oh, you too. 12.54 is the time. Will's in Manchester. Will, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. Um, so it's about the house plants. So um, it's got nothing to do with the temperature of the house, as you were correctly saying, because obviously you put the central heating on in the winter. Yeah. It's actually to do with the quality of the light that comes through the windows. Yeah. And so when plants absorb certain qualities of light, typically in the spring when it's starting to get brighter for longer, um, it causes a conversion of chemicals inside them, uh, which then causes the uh, production of hormones, and then that stimulates the flowering and the growth. So you could fake it, you could fool it, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, you know, um, if you were going to grow certain plants indoors, um, then you can put, like, blue lights over them and red lights over them, and then it can stimulate different seasons, and then you can get flowering um, and growth at different parts of the year. And that's actually what some uh, countries do regarding agriculture. So specifically, if you go to Iceland and you go to the tomato greenhouses, then they can actually grow tomatoes all the way through the year because they actually shine certain qualities of light on them all the way throughout the year, oh, tricking them into fruiting. I love that. Qualifications? Uh, A-level biology teacher. How did you get on? How did your classes, kids get on this year? They did absolutely fantastic. I Thank had a you. feeling they might have done well. Congratulations. <laughs> and have, have this on me. Lovely Thanks. stuff. Lovely stuff. Thank you. Uh, Steve is in Broadstairs. Steve, question or answer? I've got an answer, please, James. Carry on, Steve. Marijuana yeah, uh, factories, I... marijuana factories, Steve. Because that you <laughs> yeah, use the lovely. lights to completely f- fool the plants, wouldn't you? In the the, the quality. You, so there you go. I'm glad Will didn't you, mention you, that. Go on, back. You would, you would do that. No, no. My answer is why you walk backwards in water faster than you walk forwards, and that is because as you walk forward, your leg is fully extended and creates a lot of resistance against the water. But as you walk backwards, you pick your foot up and you push it backwards yeah. and you have less water uh, yeah, resistance. Of course you do. And also your hip flexor muscle yes. is uh, not as strong as your hamstring, which moves your leg back. Well, what a beautiful answer that is. What are your qualifications? I'm a retired aerobics instructor. I'm, I'm trying to think of a joke. <laughs> but I haven't got one. I mean, I'd, I'd like you know what, like a retired aerobics. I can't. You've hung up your. There's nothing, is there? Really? Yeah, I hung up my leotard. <laughs> yeah. Does well. Did you wear? You didn't wear a leotard, Steve. Did you? I, I, listen, back in the day, what? I dressed like Mr. Motivator. Did you really? <laughs> leg warmers. Did. Leg warmers. Uh, on occasion. Oh, there you live. Oh, yeah, we have a round of applause on me. That was a beautiful answer, and it, it makes perfect sense. Of course, it, yeah. Think about it. Like you're cutting. Through the water. Uh, less resistant. Tim's in Muswell Hill. I think we've got time. Question or answer? Uh, answer. Thank you, James. Um, uh, kind of knitting together two half answers that I think you've had, which have nearly got to the answer about colouring photographs. Yes. Um, 
So basically, there is the kind of tonal differences that you kind of reference. It used to be done more by eye and kind of guesswork of, right, that looks like that colour, and I know that's that colour, so let's try and match that. And you used to have to kind of do that piece by piece as you go. Yes. That's one thing AI has got very good at in terms of working on photographs is recolouring things. And actually, earlier this week, I recoloured a photo that had been coloured with very old technology and very old way of doing things oh, yeah. um, and actually turned it back to black and white and then used modern versions to recolour it again to get a better representation of the colours, basically. Oh, how lovely. Oh, how lovely. And you, um, were pleased, you were pleased with the result. Yeah, and the client was pleased with the result, which is the better thing there as well. But um, it, it's something where I'm actually restoring, normally restoring photographs for the purposes of funeral stationery. Um, oh, how lovely. And so it's actually one of the really nice things I like about my job is actually making an old photograph, seeing again and, you know, repairing it. And re- recolouring black and white photos is something that I'm, I'm, AI has actually made me able to do because it used to be something that was prohibitively, you know, time-consuming yes. yes. and expensive. Um, but now this is one thing where it has actually got significantly good at that I can do it quite quickly. And, and it doesn't always work with all photos quickly, but sure. usually it does. No, I love that. And, and you've told us what your qualifications are. Do you, I mean, do you do this as a, a specific service or is it part of a more undertaking so uh, well if you excuse the pun then yeah it's, it's kind of something that i do as part of what i do yeah that's what um, i thought that's what i thought yeah, no it's all good uh, you know, and you've got yourself a round things, of applause yeah. round of applause Tip. <laughs> lovely stuff how oh, nice I bet that is very rewarding especially when you see the uh, happiness that it brings to the clientele if you missed any of today's show you can listen back on catch up on global play oh uh, the prize nigel obviously I, if I, well, I, I thought if i send nigel a mystery our ball game he'll stop pestering the other swimmers in hounslow uh, maybe the other swimmers will be able to get a bit of peace without Nigel coming along asking them to do his special experiments. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you'll also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as all of Global's live radio stations. Download Global Player for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, Ben Kentish is standing in for Tom Swarbrick, but now it's Sheila Fogarty. 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 Swarbrick, but now now it's Sheila Fogarty. Warbrick, but 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 now it's Sheila Fogarty.